Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing of the City Council Transportation Committee. I'm Danis Rodriguez, and I have the honor to chair this committee. First, let me introduce our speaker who will be doing his opening statement, Speaker Cory Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you for holding a Transportation Committee hearing on this critically, critically important topic. Up until less than a month ago, New York City had 140 speed cameras in school zones all across New York City. Those cameras saved lives, they saved children's lives. But now we're only a few weeks away from the start of the school year and the children of New York City are at risk. They are at risk because of the New York State Senate. The Senate has failed the city of New York and the children of this city by not extending, never mind expanding and strengthening speed cameras in school zones. They have played political games with the safety of children, putting politics before the lives of young people. This is unconscionable. I don't know how they sleep at night. Extending and expanding speed cameras in school zones is such a no-brainer that I can't even believe we need to have a hearing about this today. We are talking about saving the lives of kids trying to get to and from school. There's a reason why we're not hearing the arguments from the other side, and it's because there aren't any. While the speed cameras have been effective, again, they need to not just be uh, extended, but expanded and strengthened. Every school should have a speed camera outside it in the city of New York. On March 5th, 2018, a driver in a vehicle with a history of camera violations ran a red light in Park Slope, killing four-year-old Abigail Blumenstein and one-year-old Joshua Liu. Their mothers, Ruthie Ann Blumenstein and Lauren Liu, were also injured in the crash. And Miss Blumenstein, who was pregnant, later lost her unborn child because of the injuries she had sustained. We need camera enforcement to be tougher to ensure that drivers don't treat penalties as simply the fee for reckless driving, but rather as punishments that correct dangerous behavior. New York City schools will be in session, be back in session in just a few weeks. State lawmakers need to return to Albany to do their jobs and to extend and expand the school zone speed camera program. Time is running out on the state to do the right thing. While no single measure including the bills we are hearing today, can replace the state's extension and expansion of the speed camera program. If the state does not act, I will make sure that the New York City Council does everything in our legal power to ensure that we create safety around our schools. Again, I want to thank Chair Rodriguez for holding today's hearing. We look forward to hearing from the advocates and families today and also asking the administration uh, some questions on how we sort through this problem. Thank you very much, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your support, leadership on this issue and many other issues in our city. No, I'd like to not only thanks but dedicate, you know, this emergency hearing to the family for Safe Street and the thousands of families that we have in our great city of New York that they have lost a loved one and they now are they fighting only to seek justice for the family, but for anybody else that we never know who's gonna be the new person that in any single day will be killed, you know, by a driver that many times they even flee the scene. It, I feel that the city is committed with the leadership of the speaker, the mayor, all the agency, all the advocate group, you know, kudos to Paul T.A. and all the advocates, you know, for all those hours that every day had been investing to be sure that we make elected officials accountable. This is not about politics. This is not a, 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 you know, anything more than saying the state Senate has to go back. And if the state Senate doesn't go back, then I feel that the governor should use, you know, an executive order yes. to be sure that we restore those cameras. September 5th is very important because that day we should celebrate, you know, that our camera being restored. And if it doesn't happen, it's, a, it's one of the worst things that have happened in our city. 
you know, speed camera has been reducing, you know, crashes by 60%. So what we were telling the children and all the families that we are bringing back those, num those numbers. So again, for me, this is about being sure that we make all of them, especially the Republican, accountable, that they go back to Albany, and if they don't go back to Albany, we encourage Governor Cuomo to do it through executive order before September 15. You know, everyone knows that in 2013, in your state, passed a law permitting the city to install 20 speed cameras in a school zone. The penalty for a speed camera violation was $50 fine to the owner of the vehicle. In 2014, this program was expanded to permit 100 feet and 140 speed cameras in a school zone, but was only made effective until July 25, 2018. The speed cameras have proven highly effective and have unequivocally saved lives. Speed camera violations have dropped by over 60% in areas where speed cameras were used, have seen a decline in crashes, injuries, and fatalities of vehicle occupants, occupant, pedestrians, and cyclists. Most importantly, the number of pedestrians fatality in the speed camera zone dropped to close to 60%. These aren't just numbers. If not for the speed cameras, more New Yorkers will have been killed. The cameras have saved lives. Despite the clear success of the speed cameras, New York State legislature, legislature has not renewed the city's authority to operate them. 120 of the 140 cameras stopped issuing violations on July 25, 2018 and the remaining 20 will stop issuing violations on August 30, 2018. Without authorization from the state, students' lives will be at risk when the school year begins on September 5th. And we should know also that many charter schools are already open. It is imperative that the state legislatures immediately renew the speed camera program if the state doesn't go back to Section, the governor, as I said before, must use an executive order to renew a speed camera before schools open on September 15, September 5th. Turning to legislation, today we are hearing bills and resolution related to speed cameras and pedestrian safety. Intro 322, which I introduced, will require DOT to develop a checklist of a street de design element to the use to enhance safety throughout the design of arterial high capacity streets. DOT will then be required to state which street design element has been applied. And if an element has not been applied, give the reason for not applying it. We are also hearing intro number 971 and 972, co prime sponsored by Council Member Brad Lander myself and many old, old, other colleagues. Intro 971 will de deter dangerous driving by requiring vehicle owners whose vehicles have received five or more red light camera or a speed camera violation in a year to complete a traffic safety program. Intro 972 will require the city to study driver's behavior to determine what driver's behaviors such as different types of previous violations are associated with traffic crashes, injuries, and fatalities. Additionally, we are hearing intro number 1061 introduced by council member Majona, which will require DOT to install radar speed display signs in a school zone. Finally, we are hearing resolution number 268 introduced by council member Aliko Samu. Which, will, which calls on the state to authorize the expanded use of the speed cameras in New York City, allow for escalating pen penalties for multiple violations, and require doctors to report medical conditions that put drivers at high risk of losing consciousness or, or vehicle control. I would like to invite the sponsor of this legislation who are present to deliver the opening statement.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Councilwoman Alika Ampre Samuel, and I want to first thank Councilmember Edonis Rodriguez, the chair of this committee, as well as our amazing leader, um, Speaker Johnson, and all of my colleagues here. I am here because I share concern around street safety and accountability when it comes to reckless driving in New York City. And I am the proud sponsor of Resolution 0268 that would, as was just stated, authorize the expansion of speed cameras in New York City and provide for the escalation of penalties and consequences for multiple violations issued by red light and speed cameras, as well as require physicians to report medical conditions or incidents that indicate a driver is at high risk of suddenly losing consciousness or vehicle control. Now, as a mother of a young son who attends school and as a member of the New York City Council, I feel it's my responsibility to do something. And I think it's important for all of us to recognize the dangers that come with driving on these just crazy New York streets, not only for drivers but pedestrians. When it was brought to my attention that the New York City's authority to use speed and red light cameras in school zones was ending in July, I immediately thought about the crash that took place in Park Slope, which killed the lives of two small children and an unborn baby. And just more closer to home, on the corner of Howard Avenue and East New York Avenue in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, it's right next to a school and countless tragic crashes have taken place on just that intersection alone. So simply put, speed cameras save lives and New Yorkers are demanding this life-saving technology. So I'm just calling on the senators to just really do the right thing at this point. Go back to Albany, pass this legislation, pass the bill and allow the governor to sign it because this is just crazy and it's a matter of life and death. And so I thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to the rest of the hearing. Great, thank you. Now let's hear from another great champion this fight, great, good friend, Council Member Landon. Thank you very much, Chair Rodriguez, and I really wanna thank you and the speaker for holding this hearing. I think it's important to point out that this is an emergency hearing. The city council's committees don't ordinarily meet over the summer. Um, but this is a situation of life and death, and so we knew the right thing to do was to call an emergency hearing and come in session and talk about what we're gonna do to get those speed cameras back on and save kids' lives, and that's what we're asking the State Senate to do. If we can have a meeting outside of our normal session, they can have a meeting outside their normal session. Lives are on the line. So thank you, Chair Rodriguez, thank you, Speaker Johnson. Um, and thank you to the families for keeping this issue front and center every day. Both the speaker and um, Councilmember Ampre Samuel mentioned the horrible crash uh, in my district that killed Abigail and Joshua. Those are just two of the five kids that have been killed in my district alone in my time in office. We're gonna hear later from the grandmother of Sammy Cohen Eckstein, and I'm also thinking of Joey Sellers and Naeem Uden, whose families I have also gotten to know. And we're gonna hear from other families. It's so many families around the city that are here today and that we keep seeing who don't show up out of any reason other than they don't want the tragedy that happened to them to happen to any other family. And we're just gonna keep showing up till that happens. I wholeheartedly endorse the chairs calling on the governor to issue an executive order, but I wanna offer him one other idea as well, which is that he also has the power to call the state senate back into session, and while he cannot force them to bring up or pass any particular piece of legislation, he can call them back into session every single day, and this is an emergency, and I believe that he should call them into session every day and give them an opportunity every day to pass the bill that will restore these school zone speed cameras and, and, and we'll keep working together to make that happen. I wanna thank the chair for hearing these two bills that together comprise the Reckless Driver Accountability Act and it connects to the cameras and here's how. For the vast majority of drivers, one $50 ticket is enough to get you to slow down so that 80% of drivers who get one ticket don't get a second. And that's how these cameras mostly work, is that people get the ticket 
Either they know they don't want to get the ticket, so they slow down and they don't get one at all, or if they get one, they don't want to get a second. And that's why we see 68% drops in speeding and significant reductions we'll hear about in terms of crashes or fatalities. So that is the critical way that that program works and why it saves lives. But it also has highlighted something for us, and that is a very small percent of drivers who just keep speeding and running red lights, $50 ticket after $50 ticket after $50 ticket, operating their vehicles like weapons aimed at their neighbors. Really, the, the people we're talking about are in many ways sociopathic drivers five or more violations, it shows you just have a reckless indifference to the lives of your neighbors. And one such driver, Dorothy Bruns, is the driver that killed Abigail and Joshua, and that's what called our attention to this real gap. If you got points for these violations, you would lose your license very quickly. But the cameras don't put points on your license, they just give you the $50 ticket. So the idea that we have in the bill we're hearing today is a simple one. If you get five, that's 1%, less than 1% of drivers, the same number that Dorothy Bruns had before she killed Abigail and Joshua. We're not just going to say another $50 ticket and you can keep driving. We're going to say we're going to boot or impound your car until you come take a reckless driver accountability program and pay for that program and pay for the booting before you can get back on the road with that car. And I'll talk about this more maybe on the panel when, uh, when DOT speaks. But the program we're asking people to do has been operated by the Center for Court Innovation at the Red Hook Justice Center and in Staten Island, and has been shown to have a 40% recidivism reduction in reckless driving. We have the tools to save more lives by confronting reckless driving. We will keep fighting to get the cameras back on, and we will keep pushing in New York City to do everything we can to confront reckless driving. It is not either or, it is both and. We must do those things because the lives of our children and our families depend on it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chair, and I want to applaud you and our speaker and all my colleagues for uh, being here today and taking the aggressive approach that is needed to protect our children. The failure of the state legislator to secure funding for the school zone speed cameras is morally indefensible. We must never use the safety and well-being of anyone, let alone our children, to be used as political bargaining chips. Even if the funding gets restored or doubled from 140 cameras to 290, as some in Albany are advocating for, that will still leave about 1,000 public schools that have no form of speed control at all. We should not choose which children get protection and which don't. I urge all of my colleagues to support this bill, but also encourage that we use every tool possible. And I would imagine the most effective tool is additional law enforcement officers that can issue moving violation tickets that would stiffen the penalties and eventually get rid of some of these reckless drivers. I would all, that would also increase the number of fines that they receive, and it's just not the school system. These protections should be throughout New York City. This should be in around playgrounds. It should be around our houses of worship, and it should be around senior homes and, and high traffic areas. Utilizing every tool that's available from additional police officers to additional speed cameras to radar cameras to speed bumps to red lights to stop signs to whatever it takes to make sure that cars don't jeopardize or those drivers don't jeopardize the lives of our most valuable assets and that's our children. And I look forward to being, um, to hearing more from DOT and law enforcement as we discuss the alternatives and how we can make New York City safer for all, but most of all, in and around our school systems. Thank you. Speaker instructs us to organize this hearing in a way that we started not with the agency, but with the human faces of individuals that have been the voice for justice to restore the speed camera, and many of them, they have lost their loved one. I put the microphone back to Speaker Jones. So I want to call up the first panel of witnesses uh, for this hearing today. Uh, Joan Dean from Families for Safe Streets. Raul Ampuero from Families for Safe Streets. Hindi Schachter from Families for Safe Streets. And I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Bernadette P. 
Pietra Fessa from Families for Safe Streets. Oh, uh, yes, Chair Rodriguez, I uh, want to mention the, the members that are here today. Of course, we heard from Councilmember Amprey Samuel. Uh, we have Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, Councilmember Diaz Sr., Councilmember Peter Ku, Councilmember Fernando Cabrera, Councilmember Steve Levin, Councilmember Danique Miller, Councilmembers Brad Lander, Mark Jonai, and Councilmember Costa Constantinides. You may begin in whatever order you'd like. Just make sure the microphone is on. Uh, maybe we can start with you, Ms. Dean. If you push the button. My name is Joan Dean. I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets, and we're an ad advocacy group comprised of victims of traffic crashes in New York City. My grandson, Sammy Cohen Eckstein, was killed by a reckless driver in 2013 in front of his building in Brooklyn. He was 12 and a half, was prepared. So, it's hard. He was preparing for his bar mitzvah. He was kind and smart and charming and handsome, mature behind his, beyond his years. He loved to argue with me, and I kept telling him he's going to become a lawyer like his dad when he grew up. Sadly, he didn't get that chance, and I miss him every day. Uh, sorry. Our family has been devastated by this loss. The year Sammy died, two other students from middle school 51, Sammy's school, were also killed by traffic. We wanted to make sure this didn't happen to anyone else. And my daughter Amy Cohen, who co-founded this organization, we joined with others so that to fight for change. Families for Safe Streets was instrumental in Albany's passage of the new 25 mile an hour speed limit legislation. And after its passage, a child was hit in the same location on Prospect Park West, and the driver was obeying the speed limit, and the child survived. Families for Safe Streets has been working, leading the fight for street safety cameras in school zones for three years. We created a coalition of 300 schools, healthcare providers, and community organizations and yeshivas, Simcha, to support legislation for 290 cameras and to extend the program until 2022. The bill has bipartisan support in the legislature with 43 assembly sponsors and 35 Senate sponsors and the support of Governor Cuomo. So we have the votes and as you've heard, the cameras that are, have been shut down a few weeks ago so we urge the City Council to pass Resolution 268, calling upon the legislature to pass and the governor to sign Senate Bill 6046 and Assembly Bill 7798. I want to thank the New York City Council for helping us to save lives, being a leader in street safety, and I especially want to thank Sandy's count Sammy's council member, Brad Lander, and the chairman, Adonis Rodriguez. Thank you. Thank you, Joan, so much. You may begin. Okay, um, I'm Hindi Schachter. I'm a senior citizen cyclist, pedestrian, and driver. And in all those roles, I want safe streets. I'm here today to back up Yadonis Rodriguez's bill about Vision Zero design standards. Why am I fixating on the need for street design? Well, because of another senior citizen. Here's a senior citizen, 75 years old, in July 2014, running the race of champions put on by the New York Roadrunners Club and meddling for his age group. Many races in the future signed up for the 2014 marathon. Unfortunately, on August 3rd, 2014, this man, 
my beloved husband of 47 years, Irving Schachter, was doing an 18-mile run in Central Park in the pedestrian-only lane when a 17-year-old cyclist veered at speed into the pedestrian-only lane. They collided. Er fell back and hit his head, and it was all over. What do we learn from this? Well, we learned that we had a negligent speeding cyclist, and that, that's a problem, although the vast majority of such cases involve car drivers. But also we learn the design of the roads was poor. The lines demarcating pedestrian only and cyclists allowed were not as clear as they should be. So, of course, the fault is on the negligent cyclist. But negligent drivers we will always have, and we don't want deaths. What can the city council do? It can't abolish negligent people. Would that you could make such a law, but you can't. I'll tell you that. Your power is limited. But what you can do is you can all vote for the Rodriguez bill that when you pay the street, you have to either put in all of the Vision Zero design standards that save lives or explain why, in a particular case, one of these useful standards cannot be used. This is a life-saving bill. This is one person whose life cannot be saved from it, but I think he'll rest a little easier knowing that you've passed the bill and in his memory, I speak to the city council today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Andy, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Bernadette Carna. I am a member of Families for Safe Streets and a survivor of a hit and run crash. <clears throat> Excuse me. On June 8th, 2016, a reckless driver hit me as I crossed the street in the crosswalk with the light. The driver dragged me 50 feet and then fled, leaving me for dead. Two years later, I was traumatized again when I learned that police had positively identified the vehicle that struck me, but dropped the investigation because the vehicle owner denied involvement. That owner had been involved and two other crashes in the prior year, but police just took his word for it and dropped the investigation. Let me give you some idea of my first trauma. While in the ambulance, I thought I was going to die. I couldn't breathe as I drifted in and out of consciousness. While in the ER, the pain from the insertion of the chest tube was unbearable. I laid in the ICU recovery room for days, attached to various tubes and monitors. I was overwhelmed in constant pain. My ribs were crushed, requiring surgical fixation with metal plates. And I had numerous other fractures to my back, shoulder, knee, and foot. I was in physical therapy for nearly two years and unable to work for 20 months. The day after my crash, a detective was assigned. I was hopeful that the driver would be found and prosecuted, but police never reported back, forcing us to pursue a freedom of information request. It was 20 months before I learned the truth. What I learned is that the city has a network of video cameras that capture millions of license plates each day, called the Lower Manhattan Security Initi Initiative, or LMSI. LMSI cameras caught the license plate of the car that hit me, but because no one could identify the driver, the police just took the owner's word for it when he said he didn't do it, even though he admitted that no one else had use of his vehicle, making, his, making this his third crash in a single year. 
I also learned it is the NYPD's official policy to end the investigation when a vehicle owner denies involvement in a hit and run, even when a video or an eyewitness positively identifies the vehicle. The policy was applied in my case and the details are provided in a letter that my counsel provided to you. There are parallels to the crash caused by Dorothy Bruns, who struck and killed two children and injured their mothers in Park Slope earlier this year. Bruns had a previous hit and run, eight moving violations caught on camera, and a seizure disorder, but no one took any steps to get her off the road before she killed those toddlers. Why does the city collect all this information on reckless driving, but fail to use it to prevent reckless driving? Please enact intro 971 and 972, which allow the city to analyze all the information it has to identify and intervene with reckless drivers, to get them off the road before they injure and kill. Surviving a crash is traumatic, exhaustive, and life-altering. When a vehicle is identified as being involved in reckless driving, whether it is a camera-based violation or a hit and run, if we give the owner an automatic pass or a slap on the wrist, they'll just do it again. Either the owner must take responsibility or the owner must identify the responsible driver. This is what intro 971 and 972 would do give the city the tools to intervene and change driver behavior before the next devastating injury, before the next death. Every six minutes, another person in New York City is injured in a motor vehicle crash. The clock is ticking. Please pass intro 971 and 972 before the next person is hit. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Good afternoon, anyone. Hey, my name is Raul Ampuero, and I wanted to thank the City Council for this opportunity. It's not easy for me to speak at the moment, but I had to. I lost my son, Giovanni, approximately three months ago. He was nine years old. He was hit by a car. It's awful uh, for a doctor to come out of surgery and tell you that your son is dead. Um, the first thing I thought was, why? Why? And I said, God, if this is what you want, this is what I need to accept. And since then, my life has changed a lot. I see horrible things, what human being could do. And this is one of the things. They don't want to save lives. I lost my son. There's nothing that's going to bring another earth lovely ones, my son, or anyone in here. Nothing. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what religion you are or what background you come from. This is our children's. This is our children's that we want the best for them. What else do we want? That's all. We want them to grow, play, go to college, be someone Give me principle and morals. And that's what I did for Giovanni and my other two ones, which is the other one is 14, the other one is 20. And right now, he's studying criminal justice. I always tell them, the best thing is to do is go to school and be somebody. Giovanni didn't have the opportunity. I am very upset with the city. I'm very upset with the Republicans because they don't want to save lives. And you know what? Screw them. If they don't want to help us, let's do ourselves. How simple could that be? It's not hard to ask. We vote for them, and they don't want to help us? That's completely, completely wrong. My son, after wheels of the cars went over him, he was still alive, and he was asking to his mom, please, mom, don't let me go. And this is awful. This is horrible. And and every day, I try to go to the events, rallies, and I try to do the right thing because I think no parent should be burying his boy or his daughter or a lovely one. It shouldn't happen. And that's why we're here in front of all you guys 
to see what else can we do to pass this, to move on. We shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be over our families, having a good time. Unfortunately, there's nothing I could do. But I put my hands in your hands, guys. And as God is my witness, I would do whatever is necessary. So no parent should go with the pain that I'm going right now. So on behalf of myself, I'm asking you, please. That's all I'm asking you, please. It's such a common sense. We want to save life. That's what we want. And then screw them. I don't care. All I care is I want to save kids. Simple as that. So I'm asking you, Governor McCormo, I'm asking you, Mr. de Blasio, we got to do something because it seems to be that even if their own kids will die, they won't care. That's the way I see it. I, these people, they don't have no respect whatsoever, morals or principles, because they just simply don't care. If they don't care, screw them. I don't care. My son is dead. I go visit him almost every weekend at the cemetery. And I cry and I cry. And I say, Giovanni, I do whatever is necessary to save lives. And that's exactly why I'm standing here in front of you guys. And I'm begging you guys to use your powers as much as you can to save a boy or a little girl. That's all I'm asking. Is that too much to ask? I don't think so. I wanted to thank you, City Council, for the opportunity again one more time. And again, I'm stretching my hands to you guys and hope you guys will not disappoint me. Thank you so much. I want to thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, of course, you all for being here. And I'm very, very sorry for your loss. Thank you. And I want to thank you, Bernadette, being a survivor, and Hindi and Joan for everything you guys have done, the level of trauma that each one of you have experienced through these crashes and what has happened to you, the bravery and courage to be here today and to continue to advocate uh, for other folks and in the memories of the loved ones that have been lost is incredibly moving and impactful. And uh, I want you to know that this council is committed to doing everything within our legal authority to step up to the plate, given the shameful and immoral inaction that the state Senate has shown. And we even have to go beyond that. There are other things to do as well. But today is really focusing on how we get these speed cameras up and running again and what the city's role is moving forward. So um, Chair Rodriguez, I don't know if you have any questions for these wonderful more than questions, just say, we, there's no word. And now we can say, you know, you guys are the husband, the father, the partner, you know, the brothers and sisters. I, I don't think that a elected official, anyone that is not in this type of room and get to hear, you know, his story will be able to understand the feeling. And there's no word that can come from us that can express our support and solidarity. All we can say is thank you for your leadership. Here we are to continue this journey. Hopefully we are fighting for your relative one, the loved one, so that it doesn't happen to anybody else. But I know that as a father to daughters, there's no one. So, I have one question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll just, you know, extend the gratitude of the, the chair and the speaker. Your, your courage is extraordinary and the generosity to work hard to save other kids and other seniors and other families' lives is extraordinary. And I think it's worth saying you already have, like, let's remember that, the reducing of the speed limit, all the Vision Zero changes that we've made together but led by your advocacy has prevented deaths already. Of course, we'll never know who they are, thank God. Um, so thank you not just for your courage and your advocacy, but for the lives that you've already saved, other people's kids, other people's spouses, other people's family members. Um, Bernadette, I have one question for you because your story really gets at trying to identify reckless drivers from the information that we have 
before they're out there. That, you know, the speed cameras prevent the vast majority of people from speeding, but some of these uh, fatalities and crashes are caused by people who we could know uh, are going, are reckless already, and we're not yet targeting in the ways that we need to be, and that's why your story is instructive. Um, I wonder how you found that the driver that hit you had already been in the two prior crashes, or that the car had been in two prior crashes. How did you get that information? Um, I found out through my lawyer. Um, when we received the, the FOIL, the Freedom of Information Law, it had his name and a license um, plate number. So from and, that information, we were able to find. And we can follow up afterwards. Do you know what, with that information, like what database or, because, uh, you know, I, we'll follow I up with you. I we'll don't. follow up with you. Oh, all right, and Steve is your lawyer, so I'll ask him when he's on the panel later. I think this really goes at one idea we have, uh, and a powerful one, is to use the red light and school zone speed cameras, but that's only one mm -hmm. data source that exists, and the work we need to do, that's why the other bill here, 971, goes at what can we learn about patterns of behavior? We've already got all this data. Let's use it to identify and get those drivers off the street or to change their behavior before they hit you, before they hit anybody else's loved one. So thank you for sharing your story thank with you. us. Please. Right. Thank you. So thank you to all of you. Escuchamos el de las familias que han perdido ser queridos. Estamos aquí con el vocero Corey Johnson para asegurarnos que bajo su liderazgo podamos lograr de que los legisladores de Albany regresen para restaurar, restaurar que la ciudad de Nueva York continúe teniendo las cámaras que pueden detectar a los choferes que andan manejando a alta velocidad cerca de las escuelas. Este es el momento crucial porque los niños regresan a la escuela en septiembre 15. With that, we are going to the next panel, which is the DOT. Uh, I would like to welcome the representative of the Department of Transportation and Police Department who will testify on the city's speed camera program and the proposed legislation. Thank you for being here. Uh, we now ask the council to administer the affirmation and then invite the administration to deliver your statements. Speech did identify yourself so that we have your name in record. I'm Rebecca Zach with New York City DOT. Margaret Forgioni, New York City DOT. Juan Martinez, New York City DOT. You don't say. Juan Martinez, New York City DOT. Um, Thomas Chan, Chief of Transportation, NYPD. Do you affirm to tell the truth? the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee today. We do. We do. Yes. yes, we do. Okay. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Margaret Forgioni, Chief Operations Officer at New York City DOT. With me today are Director of Traffic Operations Policy, Juan Martinez, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack. Together with Chief, Chief Thomas Chan and our NYPD colleagues, I am pleased to be here today to testify on behalf of Mayor de Blasio about the city's essential, effective speed camera program and how the New York State Senate's failure to reauthorize and expand the program makes our streets more dangerous. Speeding is the le leading cause of traffic fatalities in New York City. Deterring speeding is critical because the faster a vehicle is moving, the harder it is for the driver to avoid a crash. In fact, a driver at 40 miles per hour needs 300 feet to perceive, react, and break to an unexpected event, twice as far as a driver at 25 miles per hour who only needs 150 feet. A pedestrian who is struck by a vehicle traveling at 30 miles per hour is twice as likely to be killed as a pedestrian struck by a vehicle traveling at 25 miles per hour. Speed cameras provide predictable and consistent enforcement of the speed limit, which encourages drivers to maintain a safer speed. At a school with a fixed camera, speeding violations drop by 63%. That change in behavior directly leads to safety improvements. DOT analysis shows that through December 2016, 
there were 17% fewer pedestrian, motorist, and cyclist injured in traffic crashes at schools with fixed cameras each year, and 21% fewer fatal and severe injuries annually. For instance, major streets with speed cameras in every borough saw dramatic safety improvements since their arrival. On Ocean Parkway, speeding declined 63% and 32% fewer people were injured. On 10th Avenue in Manhattan, speeding declined 83% and 26% fewer people were injured. On Forest Avenue in Staten Island, speeding declined 27% and 35% fewer people were injured. On Union Turnpike, speeding declined 80% and 43% fewer people were injured. And on the Grand Concourse, speeding declined 83% and 22% fewer people were injured. These reductions mean an average of 540 fewer people were injured, 28 people avoided serious injury, and 10 people avoided deaths at those locations each year. These safety gains were achieved despite the fact that we are restricted from enforcing the law through the use of speed cameras at night, on weekends, and at other times school is not in session. We can evaluate the effectiveness of a program by how well it changes behavior in the long term. Speed cameras have passed that test with flying colors. During the two year period between the start of the program in 2014 and 2016, just over 80% of vehicles that received one violation from the speed cameras did not receive another. That means drivers got the message and were deterred from speeding in the future by one $50 ticket. It is remarkable how much these cameras achieve. In order for the speed camera program to be effective, it must be fair. We had this in mind from the moment we began designing the program. We focused entirely on the safety benefits that these cameras could provide. Our contractor is paid a flat fee per camera purchased, unlike some jurisdictions where similar vendors are paid a commission based on the number of violations issued. We do not and would not enter into such an arrangement because it distorts the purpose of the program to increase safety. DOT experts selected locations for 100 fixed cameras after a rigorous review of crash histories and evaluation of the speeding data and the roadway geometry at each school. Additionally, we operated 40 mobile speed cameras, which we relocated daily in order to increase deterrence around the city. Each violation is reviewed by a trained city employee to confirm the integrity of the violations that we issue. These technicians inspect the video or photographic evidence carefully. Additionally, our camera systems undergo a daily self-test of their functions and an annual calibration check by an independent lab. Additionally, the Department of Finance adjudicates all violations which vehicle owners claim were erroneously issued. Those administrative law judges will not uphold a violation unless the evidence demonstrates that the vehicle cited was speeding in a school speed zone during school hours. Less than 0.05% of all speed camera violations are overturned at hearing. We consider this fact a testament to the accuracy of this technology and the thoroughness of our manual review. Now I will turn to the current situation in Albany and the safety implications for all New Yorkers of the Senate's inaction. In 2013, after years of advocacy, the state granted New York City the authority to pilot an automated speed enforcement program to deter speeding around 20 schools. The first speed camera violation was issued in January 2014. In April 2014, in order to bolster Vision Zero, the city secured an expansion of the pilot to a total of 140 school locations. The point of the pilot was to prove whether the program works and whether the city could be trusted to run the program fairly. At this point, the results speak volumes. Accordingly, over the past several years, an impressive coalition has advocated for an expansion of the speed camera program that would allow us to deter speeding at more schools during more hours. All legislative efforts involve compromise. Through a sincere and multi-year effort to address the professed concerns of the Senate majority, the proposed expansion shrank to a relatively modest increase in the number of schools, some flexibility on placement of speed cameras near a school, while also adopting reasonable new placement considerations, and a four-year extension of the program. As you may know, the Assembly has repeatedly passed this bill in multiple forms over the last two years but the New York State Senate leadership declined to allow the bill to come up for a vote, despite the fact that a bipartisan majority of senators have committed to vote for the bill if allowed the opportunity. Accordingly, DOT is now required to shutter the successful program. On July 25th, we stopped speed camera enforcement at 120 of the 140 schools, 
and as the mayor announced Monday, we are still collecting data even though license plates are not recorded. As he noted, in just over two weeks, more than 130,000 vehicles have already been spotted dangerously exceeding speed limits by the cameras. When our remaining authority to deploy cameras at 20 schools across the city expires in 15 days, we will be forced to stop issuing violations altogether. In a few weeks, school will resume, and unless the Senate's leadership reconvenes, we will not be able to use one of the most effective safety tools the city has ever had to protect our families. Proven safety programs that are saving lives should not be held hostage to politics. Now, I will briefly comment on the bills before the committee today. Intro 322 by Chair Rodriguez would require DOT to develop a checklist of best practice elements for arterial street designs and post a list of such projects with explanations if particular elements are not utilized. The elements proposed in the bill for inclusion in such a required checklist are consistent with current DOT best practices. Under Vision Zero, every street design project is considered for opportunities to enhance safety and every project includes ADA compliance. Our toolkit includes, but is not limited to, all of the elements specified in the bill, and we consider all elements for inclusion depending on the usage, existing conditions, and amount of street width available. In these ways, DOT's existing design processes accomplish the goals of the proposed legislation. However, enacting the reporting requirement in this bill would add cost and delay to the delivery of Vision Zero projects and other mobility projects by consuming project staff time with their completion. The accumulation of such requirements would reduce the quantity of projects we are able to undertake. Furthermore, weighing street design safety elements to employ in any project is individualized, complex, and dependent on any number of site-specific factors. Intricacies of these decisions cannot be conveyed in a quantifiable checklist, which would be misleading because it would not reflect how DOT is maximizing safety at any given location using our engineering judgment. For these reasons, DOT respectfully opposes the proposed legislation. Intro 971 by Councilmember Lander would provide that after a vehicle received its fifth speed camera or red light camera violation, owners must complete a required traffic safety program and that their vehicle may be subject to impoundment until they do so. This administration also supports escalating sanctions for camera violations, up to and including taking the worst offending vehicles off the road. The mayor has called for legislation at the state level to that effect, and we welcome this proposal. The council member's bill, the council member's bill raises legal issues that require further review, as well as presenting operational questions. That being said, we are very interested in continuing to work with a council member to focus on addressing the most dangerous drivers. But of course, when it comes to camera enforcement, our top priority and focus must be on renewing and expanding the city's authority to operate the speed camera program that we know has been very effective at reducing and speeding and saving lives. Fortunately, for most drivers, as we noted, even the first $50 ticket has a strong deterrent effect. Intro 972, also by Councilmember Lander, would require the Mayor's Office of Operations, in collaboration with NYPD and other appropriate agencies the Mayor may identify, to study driving behavior to identify patterns associated with crashes, injuries, and fatalities, propose recommendations based on its findings, and report on implementation of any recommendations. The Vision Zero Task Force is currently developing a variety of research initiatives which are intended to address many of the goals of this bill, including an exploration of the factors that may best predict dangerous driving. This involves reviewing what data can be feasibly obtained. The proposed legislation would require us to analyze certain data, such as that held by private insurance companies, which is not at the disposal of city government. We support this legislation and concept and are happy to work further with the bill sponsor on this proposal. And finally, Intro 1061 by Councilmember Joni would require DOT to install a radar speed display sign or speed board adjacent to every school in the city with more than 250 students. Speed boards cannot compare to speed cameras if our goal is safer driving citywide. They are by no means a practical substitute for speed cameras, which evidence shows have a far superior long-term deterrent effect. They are two different tools for different situations. While mobile speed boards can be helpful in temporary situations such as work zones, speeding reductions are modest and short-lived. 
at a cost of over $26,000 per fixed speedboard installation, placing them at up to approximately 1,600 locations as required by the bill would cost over $46 million. These funds would be much better allocated for more effective street treatments and programs selected through our data-driven approach. Entertaining this proposal distracts from the crucial importance of renewing and expanding the city's speed camera program. For this reason, DOT opposes this legislation. In closing, I would like to discuss the status of the Vision Zero initiative generally. In 2013, the year before Vision Zero began, 299 people were killed in crashes. In 2017, that number declined to 222 people, a record low. This year, we are on track for even fewer unnecessary deaths. However, much more still needs to be done, and I fear this trend will not continue if New York drivers realize that enforcement of the speed limit is less consistent and predictable. I can assure you the city is doing more safety work of all kinds across the five boroughs than ever before. Traffic signals, stop signs, speed humps, pedestrian islands, bike lanes, public education campaigns, and much more. NYPD is issuing more speeding and other hazardous violations than ever. Our sister agencies, TLC, BIC, the MTA, and DCAS, are implementing dozens of initiatives to prevent crashes involving the fleets they manage or regulate. The speed camera program complements these safety measures and protects people in a way that other inter interventions simply cannot. If that were not the case, the city would not be pressing so hard to reauthorize and expand the program. Finally, I would like to say thank you to the large and broad coalition who have fought so hard in our state capital for the renewal and expansion of speed cameras, street safety advocates, school children, seniors, medical professionals, law enforcement, labor, disability advocates, civic associations, and of course, those who have lost loved ones to traffic crashes. Together with you, this administration and our allies in Albany will not stop fighting for this vital life-saving program. And thank you to Speaker Johnson and so many of your colleagues for your strong support for these efforts. We urge the Senate to reconvene and pass this common sense and essential legislation without delay. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today, and I would be happy to take questions after you hear from Chief Chan. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and members of the Council. I'm Chief Thomas Chan, the Chief of Transportation of, for the City of New York and the New York City Police Department. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, James P. O'Neill, I am pleased to testify before you here today and the committee on the topic of speed cameras. After over four year, four and a half years of Vision Zero, New York has seen roadway fatalities dramatically decline, bucking the national trend of increased fatalities. The speed cameras installed in 140 school zones throughout our city are a vital part of the city's commitment to Vision Zero. Over the last several years, I've traveled to Albany with the Department of Transportation, the OT Commissioner Trottenberg, and other traffic safety stakeholders to advocate for the expansion of speed cameras in our city. Speed cameras are a valuable force multiplier for the NYPD. These cameras reduce speeding, keep our streets safe, they supplement the NYPD resources, and protect our city's children, seniors, and families. It is unfortunate that the cameras in 120 of these zones are no longer operable. The current state of affairs jeopardizes the safety of our pedestrians, children attending our schools in these zones, and other pedestrians also. Since July 25th, when most of the cameras became inoperable, the department has directed additional resources in the impacted school zones, specifically in zones where schools are in session for the summer, and between the period of July 25th through July 27th, there was a 33% increase in speeding summonses issued by our patrol officers in these zones. Additionally, every precinct maintains a traffic safety team. This summer, these teams have been instructed to focus on speeding and other hazardous violations in school zones. Working in partnership with our Department of Transportation, we deployed focused resources to those zones whose cameras have historically issued the most summonses. Over the last few weeks, our traffic enforcement agents have been instructed to concentrate on hazardous parking violations, 
double parking in these school zones to ensure pedestrian safety. Traffic enforcement agents and our auxiliary officers have also been supplementing the work of our crossing guards throughout the city to help pedestrians safely cross the street. The department has also engaged in a significant outreach. Personnel from the school safety division, the NYPD transportation outreach unit have been visiting schools, distributing flyers on tips and best practices for pedestrian safety. Additionally, the Transportation Bureau has engaged in a recent social media campaign that emphasizes the dangers of speeding and reckless driving, as well as the penalties and the fines for engaging in such conduct. The department is committed to conducting this additional enforcement. I want to note, however, while I have not while I have the complete confidence of our personnel, these efforts will not completely replace the workflow of the automated camera system. Last year, 140 school zone speed cameras issued 1.3 million speeding summonses. Comparatively, even with our focused efforts under Vision Zero, the NYPD patrol officers issued approximately 150,000 speeding summonses citywide last year. Moreover, on average, it takes an NYPD patrol officer 10 minutes to issue a speeding summons where a cameras can capture and record the violation automatically. In order to get to our goal of Vision Zero, we need to continue all the progress that's been made over the last four and a half years. Speed cameras are a critical component of this initiative. We strongly urge the reauthorization and the expansion of this life-saving tools. We thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My colleagues and I would be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chief Chan. Thank you, Margaret, and the team at uh, DOT. So as you all know, as per state law, 120 of the 140 cameras sunsetted on July 25th, and the remaining 20 cameras uh, sunset on August 30th if there is not action by the state to reauthorize the program. I'd love to hear, and I know we heard a little bit about it, uh, Chief Chan, and what you all have done since July 25th from an enforcement perspective, but I'd love to hear from uh, DOT and the NYPD about the city's plan to fill the enforcement gap. What, if, if for some reason they do not reauthorize this from September 5th moving forward until we get the cameras reauthorized, besides the, the good things that you mentioned here, um, with many, many more students coming back, besides the students that are at summer school right now, what is the holistic plan to step up enforcement to protect children? As I mentioned previously uh, in I, my testimony, um, speeding is certainly one of the leading causes of injuries and also fatalities. And we found, of course, the speed cameras have been very effective. They're efficient use of technology, and it both supports and it also supplements the work that's done by our uniform police officers out there. And the cameras certainly can free up our officers to do, do other enforcement out there. The NYPD supports the renewal and the expansion of this, this important program. In an effort uh, and in preparation, a contingency plan was developed in the NYPD, meeting with other units within the New York City Police Department. Uh, we are prepared uh, in the event that the cameras are not reinstated uh, on September the 5th. We have been doing enforcement, as I mentioned before, uh, the added enforcement during an enforcement initiative on the 25th, the 26th, and the 27th of July when the program expired. Currently, in each and every precinct, part of the Division Zero program is to have a traffic safety team and a traffic safety program. We've received the data from the Department of Transportation identifying the priority locations, the locations of the 100 cameras that are stationary, and also locations where we also identified as pedestrian collision prone locations. Based on these particular locations, we've deployed our officers from the traffic safety team to do enforcement, which includes uh, speed enforcement, but that also includes hazardous violations. Hazardous violations could be red light summonses, right of way, failure to yield to the right of way to a pedestrian or bicyclist, uh, disobeying signs, 
um, disobeying uh, improper turns, uh, cell phone distracted driving, cell phone and texting while you're operating the vehicle. So our officers in each precinct throughout the city, we have a traffic safety team that has been uh, instructed to conduct enforcement. On uh, top of that. Just, Chief Chen, I want to ask something on that. So, um, you know, we have 77 police precincts mm -hmm. in New York City. Uh, police precincts are different geographically. Uh, schools are cited differently throughout New York City. So some police precincts may have many more schools than other police precincts. Some police precincts may have schools that have, uh, uh, that have challenges when it comes to the amount of traffic depending on where they are cited. Mm -hmm. And so um, is there a more surgical approach that the NYPD is planning for from an enforcement perspective uh, before if for some reason it doesn't get uh, reauthorized and expanded and strengthened, looking at each police precinct, mapping out the schools in each police precinct all across the city, looking at the NYPD crash data, uh, on where there have been crashes, looking at the speed camera violation data to see which areas there have been more uh, tickets issued to understand where to surgically and strategically uh, create more enforcement uh, if there are not speed cameras. Again, there currently um, there are 100 fixed locations where we have cameras. We have 77 precincts. We have. Um, traffic safety teams working in each one of those uh, commands. What happened is that they will look at the data that we provided them, the locations. So in other words, uh, there may very well be precincts, uh, I'll use the example in Manhattan, uh, there are not necessarily any fixed cameras uh, that are in um, lower Manhattan. I believe we only have two in that location. So, but there is an expectation that the other precincts that don't have cameras will do enforcement where they see that they have speeding conditions in their local precinct areas. So what happened is that the analysis is going to be done on the individual basis by the local precincts, provided by the data uh, that we look at on a daily basis, weekly basis. On our traffic stat report, we identify pedestrian collisions uh, where injuries are occurring, and they will look, review that data and then also review the deployment of our officers to each of the locations. But in collaboration, there are a whole list of things that in the police department and other, um, the auxiliaries, uh, utilizing our traffic agents, as I indicated before, that we will supplement that to get additional officers and also visibility at those locations. Um, school safety division has a uniform task force. They visit over 100 different schools on a weekly basis. They've been asked to join in. Our neighborhood policing program NCO, sector, resource officers, community fairs, we've asked them to increase and also visit these locations that uh, have the ability to hand out flyers involving pedestrian safety, targeting our school children, and I believe DOT is also doing that, sending out teams to do that. So it's a, a group effort. It's not just uh, it's the summons aspect. It's an education portion also uh, that the DOT and also the NYPD be working on that aspect. So if the, the 140 schools that have cameras currently, will there be an effort to increase uniform personnel or NYPD vehicles outside the school as a deterrent if people are driving by and they see a police vehicle, a marked police vehicle parked? Do we think that would help them maybe slow down or if they saw uniformed officers? Absolutely. What happened is that um, as the school year begins, certainly we have a presence by our, our school safety division, uh, which is uh, those are uh, civilians, but also the uniformed task force officers. But in conjunction, uh, as part of our NCO program, we've asked our NCO officers to make visits to the schools and again to get that message across to parents and to teachers and our children that they should exercise caution when they're crossing the street. Don't take it for granted that the motors see them. So it's, it, that's part of the program also. But in, in issuing more summonses, we have the traffic safety team, as I mentioned, uh, we will have officers out there issuing additional summonses, targeting uh, speeding violations in that particular area. So it's kind of a, a co combination of parking summonses where people who are double parking, they may inhibit the people from crossing or user, utilizing the mock crosswalks and things of that nature. So I think that 
collectively. We also have scheduled just a normal process of part of our Vision Zero. We've had um, speed enforcement initiative, pedestrian safety initiative, uh, bicycle safety initiatives. Um, we have an we just completed another speed enforcement initiative that occurred um, last week on the 10th, 11th, and the 12th. So we are continuing to increase our enforcement, and they will see more officers out there uh, issuing violations for people who are speeding. Uh, Chief Jen, I was very distressed and a little shocked to hear testimony from the previous panel from uh, Ms. Bernadette Karna, who had testified she is a survivor of a crash. She was. Mm -hmm. Uh, nearly killed. She talked about that in detail. And I was, uh, and I have her testimony here, uh, and I'll just reread a part of it. It said, the day after my crash, a detective was assigned. I was hopeful the driver would be found and prosecuted, but the police never reported back, mm -hmm. forcing no. us to pursue a freedom of information request for 20 months before I learned the truth. What I learned is that the city has a network of video cameras, as you talked about, that captures millions of license plates each day called the Lower Manhattan Security Initiative, LMSI. LMSI cameras caught the license plate of the car that hit me, but because no one could identify the driver, the police just took the owner's word for it when he said he didn't do it, even though he admitted that no one else had use of his vehicle, making this his third crash in a single year. What I also learned is that the NYPD's official policy is to end the investigation when a vehicle owner denies involvement in a hit and run, even when a video or an eyewitness positively identifies the vehicle. The policy was applied in my case, and I will share that evidence in my written testimony. Uh, so uh, I have the same question that, that, um, that Bernadette asked. She went on and she said, why does the city collect all this information on reckless driving but fail to use it to prevent reckless driving? You may not be able to speak about the specifics of this case, but I would like to hear generally the answer to that question, which is, is that true that you, the NYPD takes the word of someone who's a suspect, even if their license plate or an eyewitness positively IDs them as someone who was involved in a crash that injures or kills someone? When we take a look at a, at a leaving the scene collision, um, and again, uh, on, I'm not going to comment specifics on her particular case because I'm not familiar with it offhand. But what I will say is that and identifying the vehicle is one part of the investigation and following up also to try to identify the operator of the vehicle at the same time. And again, we do need to have evidence and we work with the DA's office in terms of determining um, wh whether we have probable cause to make an arrest in, in each and every case. And each and every case will be different uh, on different times. If we have videotape of the individual exiting the vehicle, if we have eyewitnesses and so forth. But I would say that is not a blanket policy for the NYPD uh, to say that the person simply denied that uh, he was the driver of the vehicle. Because we have many people that deny that they're culpable of the robbery or the burglary, things of that nature. And of course, we just don't take their, their word for that. Well, there I is a thorough investigation that's completed by our collision investigation squad, and uh, from what I understand, I believe that is going to be a collision investigation squad that she was involved in, but again, I need to take well, a look I, at I, that. I, I've never met uh, Bernadette before besides uh, seeing her testify here today, so I don't know the specifics of her case beside, besides what she testified on, but I would say uh, I take her at her word that she testified uh, in truth today, and if the truth is that a, she never heard back from the NYPD. Mm -hmm. It took 20 months to get information, and she only got it via a Freedom of Information Act request. And the person who was driving the car was identified, uh, and the NYPD asked a question, and then there was no follow-up. That is very, very, very upsetting. It's unacceptable. It's mm -hmm. disconcerting. And I would ask you all, uh, you and Oleg, to go back and to understand the specifics of this case, but also the detective squad who works on similar cases like this, what is their protocol on how they handle this? We saw the horrible, horrible video two days ago of a child being run over by a car in Queens riding a bike. And I saw last night 
that the NYPD identified uh, the, the owner of the vehicle, mm -hmm. the suspect, and I assume that there's an investigation going on. I sure hope that the NYPD doesn't show up and ask who they think drove the car, were you driving the car, and if the person says no, the NYPD leaves. That would be shocking and upsetting, allowing someone who potentially could have killed a child and almost killed Bernadette to continue to get back on the streets of New York City without a thorough investigation. So as a follow-up, I would really appreciate the NYPD getting back to this council to give us answers on what is the exact investigation, collision investigation protocol mm -hmm. in circumstances like this and how that parallels other investigations moving forward. Because ultimately, if someone is a serial speeder, a serial dangerous, dangerous driver, we want them off the streets of New York City. And to ask a simple question and for them to deny it and then continue to drive on the streets, they're putting more people at risk. So I really need to understand this process. Similarly, it points to the fact with Dorothy Bruns, as Bernadette said, and as Councilmember Lander said, uh, we need to get these folks off the streets. And if some of the limited tools that we have are good detective work and figuring out uh, what, if there is someone who perpetrated a crime, we need that person off the street. Absolutely. And we will look into the particulars of that particular case, her case, but I would venture to say the um, collision investigation squad that comes out there and conducts an investigation, uh, we have the level of an investigation of a homicide, all right, as, as if we were sending out a homicide team to do a thorough, uh, their investigations goes from A to Z, nothing is left on turn on it, but again, we'll look into the specific of her case. I, I, maybe this case, hopefully this case, yes. uh, and we are very fortunate that she survived and is mm -hmm. courageous enough to be here today to testify, is an aberration mm -hmm. and there was a mistake. I do not know, because I've never met her before, I've never had a private conversation before, I don't know if there's currently litigation uh, with the NYPD, so, uh, and I don't know legally what you're allowed to, to say if there is litigation. I would say that uh, survivors of this deserve justice. Yes. And I think we all agree on that. Which means that if there was a mistake here in the way this investigation was handled, Number one, that should be corrected, and she deserves justice and information and transparency on the person who almost killed her. And number two, we have to make sure this doesn't happen again to other people who either lose their lives or are survivors. So I hope we can get some answers on that. Thank you, Chief Chan. So I just have a couple more questions. Uh, how much revenue was brought in by the city uh, uh, in uh, speed camera tickets since 2013? Okay, so the, um, the total revenue was 100, 183 million between 2014 and the end of 2017. Um, 183 million? Yes, but the net revenue um, is 83 million. Is 83 million. After we pay the costs. Okay, the reason why I ask that is because, uh, Margaret, in your uh, testimony, uh, and, and I just want to be clear, I said this in the beginning in my opening statement. We don't, at least I don't, I can't speak for other council members, but I do not believe that anything that we are proposing here today is a replacement for the speed camera program or even potentially would achieve the same results and yeah. data-driven results that we've seen of the effectiveness of the speed camera program. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have a full complement of things that could potentially work in slowing people down. And when you testified on Councilmember Jonai's legislation, Introduction 1061, which would require DOT to install radar speed display signs or a speed board. So for folks that don't know, if you are driving on a road and you're getting close to a, what would say with the speed limit sign is it tells you what your speed is and how much over the speed limit you're going. So if you're in a 25 mile an hour zone and you're going 38 miles an hour, it's flashing telling you're going 38 miles an hour. 
I will tell you that in my experience, whenever I've driven, I don't own a car, but whenever I've driven, rented a car, used a friend's car, and I see that I am going slightly over the speed limit, if I'm going 28 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour, I slow down when I see it flashing that. And one of the things that was said in your testimony, mm -hmm. speed boards cannot compare to speed cameras if our goal is safer driving citywide. They're by no means a practical substitute for speed cameras, which evidence shows have a far superior long-term deterrent effect. They are two different tools for different situations. While mobile boards can be helpful in temporary situations, such as work zones, speeding reductions are modest and short-lived. At a cost of $26,000 per fixed speed board installation, Placing them at 1,600 locations as required by the bill would cost over $46 million. So uh, I would love to understand data. I would love to understand other cities. I would love to understand what New York City has seen and the effectiveness, because we, at least I'm not saying that this is a replacement for speed cameras, but if this is a layered on effective tool to help. So if you have speed cameras and speed boards, would that save more lives potentially? And if we are bringing in, after costs, $83 million over the course of you know, four years, then some of that money could potentially go towards the installation of speed boards. Uh, and we're not saying they'd all, they should all be installed at once, but they could be phased in, again, at the most dangerous schools that we're doing in a data-driven way. So I'd love to hear a response to that. Okay, um, Juan will speak in a moment about some of the studies that have been done on the effectiveness of speed boards, but you know, what, what we have seen is we have put them out and what we do see is um, a very short-term temporary improvement where they're placed. But over time, you know, it's human nature. If there is no repercussion, if there is no consequence for speeding, Human nature lets you slip back and do well, what something in some case, cases. Uh, well, we certainly need the speed cameras, absolutely. And what if we had both? Well, the speed boards, again, we don't know that it's a good investment for that kind of money. We actually think that if we were going to invest into something like that at the rate of $46 million, we might be better served to put that money towards some of our street redesigns, which have proven long-term benefits. Um, so Juan will just speak for a moment about some of the studies out there that have looked at the effectiveness of the boards. And, and uh, what Margaret just said is exactly right, right? There's, the story of Vision Zero has been implementing every solution, following the data, looking at the effectiveness of every intervention that we can find. And when we have looked at the way speed boards have performed in the city, uh, and when they are new, when they're novel, when there's something alongside them, like a work zone, right? It's a good indication that, hey, there's something special here. You need to, to pay attention. And, and apparently when you're, you know, uh, drive very infrequently, for instance. Uh, but we learned that people have just tuned them out, you know? You, uh, once you see that the speed board isn't associated with any increased penalty or any reason to to, to fear uh, a consequence, right, to change your behavior. You, if you keep on going past the speed board at the same speed, nothing happens. The, it doesn't change the behavior is the ultimate result, right? Uh, there are a lot of things that, that we uh, have been doing that have been very effective uh, around schools. We've been uh, ramping that up around Vision Zero to uh, a, a dramatic degree, and not just around schools, but everywhere that, pe that kids walk. Um, but when it comes to the speed boards, when we've studied it, we've seen uh, that without that object lesson that comes with the deterrence, uh, it, the, the, the reduction in the speeds in New York City is very minimal and, and more intense at the, at when the speed board is novel. Well, I, 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 would, I would love to look at the statistics and understand the studies. I would also be interested uh, because we have been creative about Vision Zero and what we think works and using things that uh, could potentially uh, reduce uh, fatalities and injuries. What if you had a speed board that had um, a large signage on it saying there's also a speed camera here as well? Um, you know, are there ways to use both these things? All, the only reason why I'm asking is I want to be as effective as we can be with all the tools that we can be to reduce speed and save lives. Okay, I'm gonna just quickly, a couple more questions and I wanna turn it over to the chair. Are there currently any limitations to accessing uh, the data 
um, that we are getting from speed cameras. Do we have access to all the data, speed camera data? So right now what we're doing is uh, <clears throat> counting the number of vehicles that pass the camera the, and, the number, and the speeds of those vehicles. We're not collecting any information, uh, license plates or anything else. What I'm saying is the data we do collect, the city, the NYPD, and DOT has access to all that data. Yes. Okay. And um, the time of day, uh, is that collected? Yes. Okay. And um, are DOT and PD exploring ways to replace or supplement uh, the speed camera program? Is the city considering implementing its own program if this is not renewed? We don't think we're able to implement our own program. Got it. Okay, so th again, that's why we need the Senate to get back there right away. I agree with that. We need the Senate to come back, and we want to do all we can to pressure them and shame them into coming yeah. back. Um, but also, if there are other tools that we have, if they do continue their dereliction of duty, we want to um, use those tools. So I want to thank you all for being here. I want to turn it back to Chair Rodriguez and uh, Chief Chan, if you could please get back to me, Oleg, on the questions that I had about the collision SWAT investigations and how we ensure that uh, victims and survivors uh, are being treated correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for your support and leadership to this committee. Uh, is the city speaking to the counterpart in Albany to explore also the possibility that I engage the governor's office in a conversation to use the executive order to uh, restore a speed camera? Okay, we are not sure that an executive order could actually do that. So at this point, um, we aren't convinced that that would be able to reach our goals. So again, you know, we have been in contact with everybody in Albany. Um, the governor's indicated he's ready to sign it into law. We have enough um, senators in support who are willing to vote yes on it. Of course, the assembly has passed it several times. So we, we are coming back to that, that that is what needs to happen to move this forward. Okay. And in speaking to some people who are following the situation, especially some lawyers, they do believe that the governor can use his executive order to restore in case that uh, the Senate they don't go back. So you're saying that your team at City Hall, they don't feel that this is something can be done through executive order? Right, so initially we, are, we don't know that that could actually happen. Um, there's, there's doubt that that would be the case. So right now I'm not able to say for sure um, if that would be a path forward. Uh, I, again, I'm listening and speaking to some people who are very knowledgeable about this matter. They do feel that this is something that the governor has uh, the law on his side to use his executive order in case as a plan B, the Senate failed to go back there. So I just hope also that uh, City Hall will continue as a leader that you guys have been uh, with the mayors and order on Vision Zero, and, and especially this is a few days that we have left, you know, from here to September 5th. So hopefully you can continue engaging yeah. Albany and explore both. Want the Senate to go back? And as my colleague Lander, he said, you know, the governor also should explore to call the Senate. But if it doesn't happen, we hope that a city where we are close to 10 million from the 20 million residents in the state of New York, everyone should know that we are not speaking for a few couple of hundred thousand. This is about for a large percentage of the city of New York who live in this municipality. They should feel that they're safe. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, have you explored also to burn car from the surrounding schools as a, another option if, because this moment is a matter of student safety and we had to put all the car on the table. So we have, in numbers of school, probably none, not all of them, that also we can show that, you know, for them, during the time that we continue uh, this conversation, and hopefully we get majority in the Senate and we'll be able to resolve this issue in the worst scenario by uh, January next year. If that will be the situation, is the city ready 
to also explore a barney car from, uh, from the surrounding school where logistically it can be done. All right, with over 3,000 schools, that would be a, a major operational challenge to pull that off, right? The closing of streets adjacent to schools, but perhaps letting in, of course, school buses, and then, of course, you have parents dropping off. It might introduce, I'm um, just thinking out loud, it might introduce some new safety concerns, but I know in terms of personnel, in order to carry that out, that would definitely be a challenge. I, I just hope that this moment is not a matter of what our challenges or no. At this, at this moment, it's about can, do we have all the resources to be sure all the students are safe? And again, we cannot go backward. We have to continue forward. And whatever resource it takes is more valuable than the number of any life that we can lose. If by any chance we deal with the reckless drivers that also are driving over the speed limit in the surrounding school. So what I would like is to encourage, I want to put you in the spot to the administration to also look at the opportunity to identify potential schools, if not all, especially there where we have a, a, a more opportunity for, based on your own data, of uh, before having the speed camera that you feel that we also, we should ban vehicles from the surrounding school to explore that as also as an option to deal with this situation. It, when you look at August, especially from the NYPD perspective, when you compare August this year and August in 2017, it, what is the number on, on tickets given for a speed camera? The, can you say, is the same number reduction or the number has been higher increase? Since the, uh, the cameras were uh, turned off on uh, July 25th there, we've increased our speed enforcement by um, almost 18%. So our officers are out there, and I will say, as they indicated before, with 100 uh, fixed locations, we are actually, with traffic safety teams in every precinct, we um, are also getting summonses in locations that did not traditionally have speed cameras. But while there is 40 mobile ones that are moved about by the Department of Transportation, our officers are out there doing speed summonses, and I can anticipate that, uh, um, uh, again, we hopefully that Albany will step up, but again, we are prepared to have our officers continue to do uh, and increase the, the enforcement that we've had uh, during the, uh, the summer and also as we move into uh, September itself. Okay, so I'm not gonna be getting on why DOT refused to support my bill. Uh, of course, I don't take no as the answer. I feel that we have to continue, and as we've been working, I can say, oh, uh, in working together in many initiatives. I just want for you to know that I definitely will continue pushing to you guys and continue conversation on this bill and also many of the bills that we are listening today. But I, I will, I'm gonna leave it here so that my uh, colleague also would have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we were also joined before by uh, Council Member Salamanca, but now we have a question from Council Member Lander followed by Council Member John. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and to DOT and the NYPD, thank you for being here and for your strong advocacy to get those speed cameras turned back on and expanded and all your Vision Zero work. Um, I'm going to start with this question about Albany, um, uh, just to make sure, and I know you guys are not the law department or uh, the uh, opiners on the New York State Constitution. Uh, and I, you know, I like the idea of the governor issuing an executive order, but I'll, I'll uh, leave that to the, to the chair and others. But on this idea uh, that the governor has the power to call the legislature or the Senate back into session, I think it's pretty clear under Article 4, Section 3 of the New York State Constitution that the governor has the power to call either the whole legislature or just the Senate uh, back into session. Do you have the same sense I have of the governor's powers in this matter? Yes. Yes. <laughs> That's good staff. Third sense. It's pretty straightforward. The governor clearly has the power to call the legislature and or just the Senate back into session. And I'll just you know say this again. He obviously cannot force them to vote on any particular legislation. So 
if what happens is he calls them back into session and they get up there and they refuse to vote on the bill to expand and extend the speed camera program, shame on them. Let's do it again tomorrow until they vote to restore those cameras. So um, thank you for continuing to push. I guess I'll say it this way. If, those, um, if the sessions were called, would the city and its uh, legislative and DOT be willing to send representatives of the city up to answer any questions and provide any information needed about the program? Absolutely. Outstanding. Thank you. Um, we just need the Senate Republicans to go in and do that, and we'd be happy to show up. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so uh, thank you for your feedback on intros 971 and 972. Um, I appreciate your willingness to work with my office on both of those to drill down onto the details. Um, obviously, on the one that's about data, we have to figure out what data we can get and, of course, work on the legal and, and operational issues. And I don't want to spend too much time late this afternoon drilling in. We'll be glad to follow up afterwards. But I would like to just talk a little bit about the particular effort of focusing on the most reckless drivers and getting them off the road before they uh, kill someone or do more harm. We have done together many great things through Vision Zero, so I want to give credit where it's due. Big effort at DOT, significant effort at NYPD, to man, and lives have been saved as a result, and we need to get the cameras back on as part of that effort. But it does seem to me an area where we have not yet really done nearly enough or as much as we could is this issue of identifying those most reckless drivers. We've got a whole set of programs for making intersections safer, the set of programs, the speed cameras work to slow people down. Uh, we have a, you know, the crash investigation squad that looks at crashes after they happen. But a thing it seems to me we just haven't started really doing yet is focusing on what data do we have that points us to those drivers who are most likely to cause harm as a result of this range of data that we have, and then what interventions would either change their behavior or get them off the road uh, before they kill or injure. Um, obviously, it would be great if the state was a partner here, since, of course, the DMV is who keeps people's licenses um, and points go against licenses. But there is the issue that, A, right now the state is not acting as our partner. And even if they were, this disjuncture between the camera violations, which are of cars, uh, and written human violations, which can go against a driver, um, create this space where we now have a lot of data, a lot of information that we could be using that we're not yet using. And I guess I'll just uh, end the question with this. You know, um, the speaker spoke before um, about Bernadette's case, um, and I just am going to underline a little about Dorothy Bruns's case because I mentioned all the camera violations. What I didn't mention but has been publicly reported is she also had been involved in a hit and run in Queens that wound up in a file drawer, it seems like, at the precinct. And I know you guys acted um, in that case to discipline the individual officer. But it's not clear to me on crashes, for example, that don't get a CIS investigation and where the precinct does the investigation, you know, because no one, thank God, was killed or likely to die or very seriously injured. You know, are those just winding up in file drawers? Are the hit and runs more generally put in the database? And are we doing everything we can? And if not, how can we start taking steps to do everything we can to gather all this data and use it to really focus on identifying those most reckless drivers? To me, it seems like that's the principle of ComStat or traffic stat, but we're not yet having reckless driver stat. So can you talk a little about um, what's underway and how we can work together? Again, I'm not interested in playing a backwards looking uh, blame game here. I'm interested in working together moving forward to figure out what can we do to focus on the most reckless drivers and use effective interventions to either change their behavior or get them off the street before they injure or kill our neighbors. Okay. So we totally agree with your approach here and your concept that there is a lot of information out there and we wish we could use it and we want to be able to use it and be able to prevent some of these crashes and get some of these people off the road. It's complex legally and we know we have to work with the state on this. Um, we're working on sitting down with DMV shortly to kind of go through some of this. They have all the data. Um, they're really the keeper of a lot of the good information. Of course, we do have some on our end with the cameras, but we need to start with them. So we do, we do plan to work on this. We want to work on this. We have to kind of wrap our hands around how it's going to happen legally. 
What's the data that DMV has that, well, that DMV we don't? has all of the points on the licenses, all the violations, um, validity of licenses, car registrations, et cetera, et cetera. But don't the, I mean, I guess it seems to me there's a lot that, a lot of that is collected by the NYPD in the first place, right? But, well, I'll, yeah, go ahead. May I? Uh, the, other, the other half of it is once you have the data, once you've identified these drivers, what is it that we can do to keep them from harming somebody, right? And the state has a lot of power there, but they don't view, it hasn't been tradition that the DMV views traffic safety in the holistic way that we do, right? Uh, the, it's a, it, New York State contains multitudes. There's a lot of different types of reasons that people have to be able to drive. So some of the decisions that they make at the state level, for instance, that you have to accumulate 11 points within an 18 month period before they start talking about suspension, right? Like that's a very high standard, right? And it makes sense outside of New York City Perhaps there should be a different approach in New York City. That's the kind of thing that you would be advocating for once we collected all this data. They have to be our partners at the outset of this project. So I'm, gonna, I'm all for getting the DMV and Albany to be stronger allies here. If they had a Vision Zero approach, we would be a lot better off. And I appreciate uh, your efforts to bring the DMV more on board that when the camera legislation is reauthorized, it allows for escalating penalties. That's part of um, Councilmember Amprey Samuel's resolution. So those are all good things. I don't have confidence that that is going to happen. And I don't, we, we can't wait until we change Albany's approach to street safety to take this focus on reckless drivers. So I guess what I do want to know is what can the city do we, we, you know, for the cameras we have, for the tickets we write, for the crashes we get information on with the LMSI, you know, and there's a lot of different things we could do. I, you know, poli police officers go knock on their doors and say, you're operating your vehicle like a weapon aimed at your neighbors. We're here to prevent that from happening. So I'm sure we could do that, you know, so I, I think there'd be a range of things, and I guess, I, I, you know, are you familiar with the, I think you guys are, because you're partners in the program at the Red Hook Justice Center, this driver accountability program that preliminary data says, you know, achieves 40% recidivism reductions. That's just done by the NYPD working with the courts to refer cases into that program, rather than just letting them go to the DMV for points on a license, which maybe should be meaningful, but, but currently aren't. So. What are we doing as a city to get more focused on the most reckless drivers, identify them through the data we can have with or without the state, good to pursue the state, and achieve some additional interventions? Currently, we, we do have in place also where we have individuals, uh, drivers who are suspended as a result of not responding to summonses and things of that nature. In other words, you get a speeding summons and you don't answer the speeding summons or you're driving uh, in other violations. And subsequently, as a result of that, the state will um, uh, suspend your license to operate on the road. And subsequently, if you are stopped by a police officer, for an example, currently in our patrol guide, if you're involved in a collision, um, the officers will then run your name and conduct a name check and things of that nature. If your license comes back suspended, the officers will, in that case, they will not issue a summons. They will actually arrest you. And again, that's a, a, that's a program and a, an arrest that's been in place for many years as long as I can remember. And that's certainly an effective tool targeting individuals because again, if you're not answering the summonses when you receive them, then therefore you're likely, there's a possibility that you may flee after you strike another car or another individual. And that's a uh, summons or an arrest that I've been encouraging and continue to talk about at almost every traffic stat for the last four years since I've been the Chief of Transportation. It's an important one because the individual um, if he has multiple suspensions or for whatever reason, again, uh, could very well decide to leave the scene because he says, I know I'm going to be arrested. Okay, and, and just to add to that, what we want to do is explore this further, um, talk with you. You know, we need to look at the due process of people and take that into account. So we think it's pretty complex and also, you know, where the state sort of has jurisdiction and what the city can actually do. So 
we'd be really happy to explore with you further. That's great. And I'll, I'll do you have one more thing, Chief? I, I, do, I will mention, uh, uh, year to date, uh, we've arrested 17,361 individuals for VTL 511, which is a suspended license this year. So, so that's a, a useful stat, and I think it speaks to thoughtful and creative use of the powers that the city has um, and how we can more strategically be using them in pursuit of our Vision Zero goals. Um, and I look forward to, to following up with you. I won't, I won't take more time today. I'm, I'm a big believer in due process. Um, I'm not a big believer in all the ways the state preempts us from doing things, but I recognize that we may in some cases be stuck with those even if uh, we don't believe in them in the way we believe in due process. So, um, but I am really confident that even with just the powers that New York City and the tools that New York City has, we can take some significant steps forward in using data to identify the most reckless drivers and piloting a set of interventions that change their behavior or arrest them or boot their cars or a set of things we will conclude we have the legal power to do um, even where we are now. And I'll just conclude by saying, I think just so it's clear for the record and the public, none of this is a substitute for getting those speed cameras back on. The Senate and, you know, needs to do that today, if not today, then tomorrow. The governor should call them back into session. Uh, but I appreciate the willingness to work together to confront reckless driving and take further steps towards saving lives. Thank you. Council Member Genoi. Thank you. Um, once again, Chief uh, Chan, I want to thank you for the incredible work that you're doing, as well as uh, each and every man and woman in blue. You did mention something that uh, concerns me. At the beginning of the school year, you anticipate putting additional agents out there uh, that would be issuing tickets. Um, is that what I understood for double park cars and? Um We've actually instructed our traffic agents to target that already. So what happened is that uh, when I meant that when the school year starts, you're going to have the school safety personnel, uh, you're going to have the school safety task force that are going to visit schools that are open. If they're not, they're closed right now, they certainly will not be visiting. So there certainly would be an increase in visibility of uh, the police department personnel and activity around these schools um, when the school actually opens or a week before when they start um, as the individuals start showing up. But when you say presence, does that mean enforcement of traffic laws as well? Uh, I'm going to say that the traffic enforcement agents, are, they're out there currently in doing the enforcement, and they're going to continue all the way up to the school uh, opening itself. But where the actually physical presence of school safety agents and things of that nature, that's not going to occur until uh, when the schools themselves open. But I'm asking a specific question. Will that mean enforcement of traffic violations? Uh, the traffic and uh, the enforcement will be beforehand because, as I mentioned before, we did uh, enforcement on the July 25th, 26th, 27th. Last week, we just did a, another speed enforcement. So we are going to continue to do enforcement, and it's occurring as we speak, or um, there will be speed initiatives that also will be scheduled. So it's not that we're going to wait until uh, September 5th, then we're going to start. No, my concern, Chief, is simple. Um, we know that our hardworking parents, um, during, when the school year begins, make every effort to drop off their children. And we know that dropping off children requires double parking. What I'm afraid of is this aggressive approach by traffic agents storming, similar to what we've done uh, for uh, clear curbs, um, in and around our schools, issuing tickets for every mom that's dropping off a child, um, which is pretty much been tolerated uh, in the mornings and when they pick up their children. So I'm afraid of over enforcement and I'm not referring to speeding, which obviously in itself warrants the uh, additional attention. I'm concerned about the double parking, that we won't have an aggressive approach of ticketing of these hardworking mom and dads that are dropping off or picking up their children. Um, during the uh, school year, I've actually heard both sides of the story where school officials uh, certainly try to work with the parents, advise them not to drop off directly in front of the school itself and to advise the parents and things of that nature. Um, there is, and as a parent myself, and luckily my children are older now, but there's a 
um, area where we want to drop off our children, watch them enter the school, but then that also causes congestion at that location. And when our children are able-bodied and can, it makes it much more difficult to drop them directly only at the entrance, but then that really causes uh, traffic congestion. And the other parents say, well, why aren't we doing anything because all, all these individuals? So again, if they can spread it out, we can try to work with them. We're not looking to try to catch them as they're dropping off their children, but I'm talking about where people double park and they're blocking the, uh, the crosswalks. Now people have to walk around them and where uh, the motorists are not expecting to see them at certain locations. So, but again, the whole idea behind this is not to uh, gotcha the parents who are dropping off their children, but uh, we certainly want them to work with us. And uh, if they have to spread it out and, and drop off, that works much better. Gee, I, your presence is certainly something that I welcome, and traffic agents helping with the flow of traffic is something that I welcome, and it cre creates for a safe environment, and it creates for traffic to flow more smoothly. I am certainly supportive of that. I'm worried about little Johnny starting pre-K or kindergarten, uh, where every parent is looking forward to dropping off their child that first day of school, uh, for what's going to be a long <laughs> uh, what we hope would be many years of uh, education for that child, that every parent tries to be a part of, and I'm afraid of an overzealous um, attack on those cars, and I will work on it, but you understand my concern. Your presence is welcome, certainly to help with the um, flow of traffic mm -hmm. as well as the safety. We'll bring back that message, and I'll make sure it is part of the message to our traffic agents is that we be considerate, and I understand that. The, We're working with our parents, not looking to penalize them. Yes. Thank you again for that hard work. I'm going to turn to DOT, and um, you mentioned an executive order is something that you do not believe would reinstate the uh, speed camera program. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Because what we believe and what can actually be perceived. So this right, could have so been over. Member, yeah. Right, so I'm not an attorney. Um, um, we've spoken very little about the details of this. This is what um, that I'm aware of, that there are some serious challenges here. The devils are the devils in the details of working that out through an executive order. So I don't want to, um, I, I don't have a lot more information to share with you at this moment. What we can do is try to follow back up with you and the rest of the council um, after getting some guidance from, from others. I just want to make sure that we're pursuing every yes, possibility to restore the speed camera program immediately. Right. And if that means asking the executive, asking for an executive order, we should be doing so. Mm -hmm. I don't want that off the table and focus on the Senate uh, coming back to Albany when perhaps this can be done uh, with the stroke of a pen. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to hear that you're going to be committed to looking into that and if, uh, if necessary, ask for an executive order on the the reinstatement of our speed cameras. Good, so we will follow up with you, yes. Yeah, but following up doesn't mean that you're... We, we, trust me, we want these cameras back on as much or more than anybody else. Um, so you have our commitment that by all means, if there were other options, we would want to know about them and pursue them. So we, we will get you more information. Great. Uh, in addition, um, I would imagine the most effective uh, way to prevent speeding or driving behavior um, and making sure they comply would be using law enforcement, correct? Um, the, the cameras have proven to be an excellent alternative to having a law enforcement person physically there. Right, the physical presence of a law enforcement agent would probably be the most effective way of uh, making sure our motorists are complying with the laws. Well, in the case of speed by schools, I have to say I think the cameras um, are outstanding in that they're quite scientific. It doesn't take manpower. Mm -hmm. They're generated almost automatically. They're required by, um, of course, we carefully look at each and every one and we analyze them. We have people that do that. Um, but it alleviate, alleviates a big burden on NYPD, so I would argue that it's an excellent alternative to having um, police an officers. An alternative, but probably most effective would be having a... I don't know. I'd, let me, I'd, I'd like Chief Chan to give you his thoughts on that, too. Well, I think we just heard testimony that speed cameras are great. They issue a ticket, but there is no revocation of licenses. There's no points. There's no arrest. 
those would be immediate. Those are advantages to having a person. Issue. Very good. So there would be an advantage to having. So that would be the first the first choice. And then obviously alternatives would be the speed camera. Right, but at and the volume that we're issuing, mm -hmm. you can't beat the speed camera program, right? Okay. And so here's my could, question. If, okay. I'm sorry, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like no, to please. elaborate on that. Right. If you want to deter uh, somebody from breaking the law, there are really two ways to do it. Right. One is you have uh, unpredictable and, and, you know, unfortunately inconsistent enforcement, but a really high penalty. Or you have a minor penalty, but consistent and predictable enforcement, right? And so with the speed camera, even though it's only a $50 ticket, even though there's no points, even though your insurance doesn't go up, but people have the perception that the enforcement is everywhere, we've seen a change in behavior that, you know, NYPD has done an incredible job during Vision Zero, nearly doubling the number of speeding tickets, tripling the number of failure to yield tickets, mm -hmm. and so on. But the, the, the predictability and the consistency of the speed camera enforcement, mm -hmm. that's just why it's so important that okay. the, the program resumes. So walk me through this. I drive by a school, previous to the shutdown of the program. Right. I drive by a school where there was a speed camera. What, at what time do I get, or how many days before, after the incident do I get a notice in the mail? Within 15 days. 15 and, days. And usually far sooner than that. So that would mean I could conceivably be driving around for 15 more days before I receive a piece of mail that notified me that I am in violation of the speed, law, speed limits and subject to a fine. What we expect, though, is that because it is so well known that speed cameras are in use in New York City, that people change their behavior before they get to the school all over. The, that, the, the but your testimony just showed 130,000 violations were issued since the program was turned off that you've been following. It's a big city with a lot of drivers. Yeah, and they weren't so issued. So that they statement wouldn't be true then, first. what you're just saying, that because they know the cameras are there, they'll generally slow down based on the evidence we have. Listen, I don't, I'm not exactly sure where you're going with it, but um, I think the point is that once people do get one, they do alter their behavior, okay? Or they Knowing, avoid it, but yeah. Well, but then they don't know where all the rest are and there are a lot of them out there. We do believe that people are really altering That's their behavior. And the fact that they have to wait 15 days, you know, every we all have a driver's license, we all passed the test at DMV, we're all responsible for our, you know, our driving, right? Okay. So they don't that, need to That's where this. I'm actually headed with all this. Because my understanding, it's only covering 10% of the schools that are out there. Yeah. It's not that covering them all, yes. I'm sorry? Correct. That means 90% of the Johnnies and Lindas uh, in our lives are not being covered by speed cameras. And I'm reiterating the bill that I introduced that a radar system would be an immediate indication to a driver and the speaker articulated so wonderfully that when you may not be realizing you're speeding that this display that would inform you of how fast you're going and what the speed zone is, should be very effective in controlling speeders and reckless driving and protecting our children. And I'm just surprised at the approach of DOT, as well as the argument that's being made about the cost. And it just so happens that I reached out to those that provide these systems, and we see them all over the state, and predominantly in Long Island and Westchester and throughout the country. So there's plenty of data that shows that these radar cameras do work. And I'm not saying this should take over speed cameras. But in the meantime, there's no reason why we shouldn't be installing them in or around every school to help deter any speeders. The data exists that shows they do work. And the cost that you have referred to, and I believe it says here, $26,000 per fixed speed board. Mm -hmm. Well, I've contacted a few of these companies that do business with the city of New York and the rest of the state, and we've gotten pricing from $2,800 to $3,900. Mm -hmm. You're quoting right. this 10 times that mm -hmm. dollar amount. And that doesn't take into consideration bulk purchase discount or any other negotiations that we could possibly use because 1,200 schools, um, and if they only have two sides, that's 2,400 schools, and that's 2,400 speed radars on top of the 
other tools such as speed bumps, stop signs, red lights, uh, using of uh, traffic agents and speed cameras that would truly provide for a safe environment. So I question the validity of the number of et the estimated price when I've got quotes here from right, reputable so companies. Go ahead. Yeah, we, we understand there's a wide ranging type of product for speed boards. There are some that simply attach to a light pole. Mm. Um, there's all different types. In the New York City environment, we, would, we don't believe that those sort of lower end models are gonna cut it for us, okay? We have a lot happening in this environment. There's a lot of visual things going on. We would want one that is much more visible it would be bigger. It wouldn't just be attached to a light pole as most of these models are. And we do have some speed boards and we do find them useful in certain locations as we testified. So we are already experienced in the use of speed boards and what can kind of um, work best in the New York City environment from a durability and from a visibility perspective. So it'd be the up, we believe it'd be the upper end. And I have one last question for you. Um, what's preventing us from installing cameras so we can get the data that's needed uh, as we move forward. So similar to what we're doing right now, we have cameras collecting information without actually doing anything with the information. Mm -hmm. So we do, for traffic related purposes, we do um, take camera footage at times. If we're planning safety projects, often we'll mount a camera for three or four days on a corridor to see what's happening, to look at the double parking, to look at the behavior of people. So we do use cameras in order to collect information. So nothing, prevent, Albany wouldn't prevent us from installing Correct. these cameras for right. observation. Okay. So why aren't we installing more cameras that can observe what is actually happening in our roadways and notice be sent without a violation to those vehicle drivers, those mm -hmm. drivers of these vehicles. And uh, that will help give us a better indication of what is actually happening on all city streets and particularly in around the safety zones or the safe havens mm -hmm. that we would hope mm -hmm. uh, our school system mm -hmm. uh, falls in? No, it's an excellent question. So the way we selected the location of the current cameras, we looked at crash analysis, we looked at speeds, we looked at the roadway design or geometry. We did all of that to pick the locations we, we know that we have the biggest problem at. And every year, you know, we reevaluate things at schools in order to see what has shifted and what has improved. So we feel we have a pretty good handle on it, but it's an interesting question that you raise. I hope more than interesting. I'm hopeful that we can use every tool mm -hmm. available to us um, that would help not only provide the data, but also um, make sure that our reckless drivers uh, start changing their behavior. Um, using every method possible, whether it be visual displays, summonses, potential uh, arrest and uh, revocation of their licenses. Um, I would encourage that we continue to focus on the real importance here uh, and not allow this to become a political football for any other reason, including asking for an executive order, installing speed radars, installing speed bumps, installing red lights, stop signs, yield signs, and additional traffic agents at every one of the New York City schools that we currently have. And whether that's 1,200 or 1,400, uh, I leave that to you, but I think everyone's child deserves the same protections, and we shouldn't be picking and choosing which child will receive those protections over another. Thank you. Uh, so the next tally, Councilmember Dodge, uh, Richard and Miller. Uh, thank you. I've been here since one o'clock. Um, so firstly, um, it's kind of upsetting because we, we're all sitting here, all city agencies with city council members and residents of the city of New York, and we're sucking our thumbs today because of something the state didn't do. Um, Vision Zero is in effect for quite a while, and when we're, when we're talking about protecting our children, we should have already had some type of plan, even without relying on the state, uh, when it comes to speed cameras. Um, secondly, we have here Representative Chief Chen, who represents the police department. You, you, you represent traffic. Do we have anyone here from patrol? 
No. So my question is, I, when someone is speeding, we're talking about speeding, we're not talking about double parking or triple parking, we're talking about speeding. To my knowledge, a traffic agent cannot stop a speeder, cannot do a car stop, is that correct? Right, um, our traffic agents, um, other than the construction unit, uh, do not issue moving violations. Um, and again, uh, representing the, the police department, patrol, uh, we work with patrol and confer with them all the time. So, I mean, I think patrol share. should have been here, but if a traffic agent cannot issue a moving violation and only harass people dropping uh, their children off for double parking, we're talking about speeding. The whole issue today is speeding, that's number one. Number two, I have been discussing traffic control offices for the last four years. And I've been saying that, yes, if we have speed cameras, we cannot rely only on technology. We need to have traffic control offices near our schools to direct traffic. Uh, we cannot say, oh, we have technology and that's gonna protect our children. It doesn't work that way. We need to have human beings there as well to control and direct that traffic, just like school safety offices. So the, how many traffic control offices, number one, do you have throughout the city of New York, throughout the five boroughs? And how many of, that, of those traffic control offices do you have within station within like 100 feet from schools? I'm gonna give you an approximate number of uh, traffic agents. We have over um, 3,200, uh, that's an approximate. I can get you the exact number uh, down the road. What happened is that, uh, again, um, when we're talking about traffic enforcement agents, again, these are civilian members of the service uh, who are, we have some agents who are directing traffic, and then we also have uh, agents that are also um, issuing summonses. Now, I'm speaking about the ones issue. that are direct, directing traffic, not the ones issuing summonses. Not the ones that are issuing parkism. Right. But who are directing the traffic, traffic control, um, the level two traffic control offices that direct traffic. How many do you have in the five boroughs? I'll give you, I'm gonna to have to get back to you the exact number of people who are uh, directing traffic. How many from those actually are assigned near schools because there is a school there? We've deployed our traffic agents based on traffic volume, uh, depending on the location. Uh, for an example, if we are in the vicinity of the Lincoln Tunnel, uh, the Holland Tunnel and things of that nature, so we will deploy the off uh, officers or the traffic agents. So there's no one near school. So my, my point is, and I'm gonna say it again, I'm gonna say it to everyone, I'm gonna say it here live, that we need to make sure that we have an extra layer of traffic control officers, level twos, Near our schools, we have 900 approximately public school buildings, 300 approximately private school buildings. And in the mornings and during um, when schools begin and in dismissal, those are the two crucial times. It's not full day, but when children are going to school because unfortunately there is not, you don't have bus service for all school children. Uh, depends what grades, depends how old you are. So parents are forced to either drive the children to school or to have the children walk to school. So that is why it is important to have traffic control offices uh, at all our schools during the morning hours and during dismissal. That is important and I think this is something we need to focus on because if we had that when I brought this up four years ago and the state shuts down the cameras, at least we had those layers of protection. Uh, finally, I just wanna say that school safety officers, um, how many open requests do you have, how many requests do you have, open requests do you have for school safety officers that are not filled as of today? I don't have that um, number at this particular time, but I can get back to you. So what, I, what I'm saying is, is that we're on the 12th hour now, and we should have a plan already. We should have these answers. We should have the school safety offices and crossing guards in all our schools, making sure that all the gaps are filled, that if there are schools right now who don't have enough school crossing guards, and if there's any open spots, open slots in schools, requests, we have to have this filled today. 
we cannot wait till the till 12th hour and, and then start fumbling then and sucking our thumbs. Um, our children, we all know, we had people who testified today, and yeah. really, I was, I'm here since 1 o'clock, and out of respect for the people that testified today, I'm, I'm still here, and I want to thank you very much for having the courage and coming out today. And unfortunately, I, I sh no one should know what it feels like to lose someone uh, who's near and dear and loving to them. So I thank you for coming out here today. But we need to be better prepared. I'm going to say it again. My time is up. Traffic control officers at every school, when children go to school, during dismissal time, school safety, crossing guards at every school. We have to make sure that all those gaps are closed. And we also need to make sure that, in addition to traffic agents, we need um, patrol. We need offices, live offices. Thank you very much. Councilmember Miller, I mean, reach your bottom for me. Okay, sorry, he's the better looking version of me. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to gear my question, thank you, Chair, uh, for holding this hearing. I wanted to gear my questions more to DOT on. Um, strategic planning around accidents and, 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 and obviously we know we've in the Rockaway Peninsula suffered two pedestrian deaths over the past month and then obviously we have the 11 year old who was hit yesterday which was a hit and run incident um, who was stable. Um, what triggers, uh, when do conversations occur between PD and DOT when you notice that they are, what would trigger a conversation between the two agencies when you notice a pattern of particular uh, uh, that has been troublesome for, for a long time? Do you have discussions on these things? So for instance, if there have been five accidents at a corner, when would we communicate that to DOT? We are in direct contact with uh, DOT on a regular basis, and I can tell you um, at every traffic stat, which is uh, scheduled on Thursdays, mm -hmm. um, and there's one scheduled for tomorrow, and there was one scheduled last mm -hmm. week, mm -hmm. and there was one we meet and there are DLT uh, representatives from that particular borough who are present at our meeting. So if there is anything of urgent in nature that we spot, um, our statisticians and our people who look at the, the collisions and things that are nature information share this on a regular basis. It's on, they're only a phone call away. So they are present at our meetings on a weekly basis. Um, again, we have another. I'm going to move from you, though, because I want to know what DOT does with that information. Right. Um, First of all, we does have Does that automatically, sorry to cut you off, does that automatically trigger a study for an intersection okay. or what right. happens? So what we do is we, we run on um, different bases, like quarterly and yearly. We run fresh information on areas of concerns. We run our major corridors. You know, every year the Vision Zero corridors shift, right? Some of them um, we've addressed through our safety projects and then others emerge as the next set of them. So we are, we are periodically updating our information. When no. we have something like what you're describing in the Rockaways, um, you know our borough commissioner, you know between mm -hmm. the rest of us watching the press office, everything. If we have sort of um, an uptick in an, in an incident, yes, we do reach out to PD. Um, we have three different period, you know, monthly meetings with PD um, with different groups of, of DOT and some with Chief Chan and some with his colleagues. We, we do a lot of safety education and outreach around locations like that, and then we do look at whether or not, usually um, it, you know, we create a project, our design team, our planners, and our engineers will create a project for problem areas like what you're talking about. And then uh, okay. one last uh, aspect of this collaboration comes from uh, our work on the Vision Zero Task Force, not just NYPD, but Department of Health, uh, the city fleet, the Taxi and Limousine Commission, other agencies uh, meeting several times a month to go over the data, go over the trends that we're seeing. Uh, things like uh, the, the police department's efforts on motorcycle enforcement came out of conversations of that task force. Uh, things like the uh, dusk and darkness, the special emphasis on enforcement during the winter months when, when light is, uh, is at a premium. Uh, late in the evening, it, those successful initiatives came out of that really constant collaboration. That's the, the benefit of Vision Zero, is that we're talking at a, at a, at a depth and, and uh, that has never been before. 
Okay, so sounds good. Um, so Merrick Boulevard, and I'm gonna get away from Rockaway for a second, was one of the most dangerous intersections to which I was astounded at when we saw the actual pedestrian, um, uh, well, not only deaths we had there, but also accidents. And it seems like the only time these things are dealt with is when an elected official's office brings it to your attention. Um, and there was movement, and I want to thank uh, our Queensboro Commissioner for movement on it, but it's just a little bit astounding on how any time we pick up the phone to study then starts when obviously you are seeing patterns before we would see it, you're seeing the crash data. Uh, I think we had over 100 crashes on that particular stretch. I'll mention Rockaway Boulevard and Brookville Boulevard. Uh, Rockaway Turnpike, same thing, and it seems to be no immediate action until our office gets complaints or we complain to you. How many people are on staff to do these studies? How many people are assigned to do traffic studies uh, in DOT? So if you can break down by borough. Yeah, we don't, we don't have them allocated by borough. We have teams of planners and others who do it as part of their job, some who do it as all of their What's job. What's the ballpark figure? I, have to, I will have to get back to you, but. I actually what, know the answer to it. I'm well, asking this question. That's interesting because right. I'd be anxious to hear what your answer is. <laughs> no, I, um, I, 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 it's the but, lawyer's rule. Ask the okay. question Fine. Here, that you know you the answer to. Okay. Did we see an increase in the budget? Because clearly, and I know this from my office to Councilmember Miller's office, every council member's office is getting an uptick in requests for it's, and we are getting the three the three one one data now sent to us on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and we can clearly see based on that data that the number one request for my district and I'm sure citywide seems to be street lights, the speed humps, mm -hmm. stop signs. Mm -hmm. That is consistently across the board, but there seems to be every year when we have this budget discussion no real uptick in the amount of engineers and people who do these studies being put into our neighborhoods. Our so I'm interested in seeing yeah. what the numbers are and if there's a real plan to okay. increase the number since we're getting such a much higher volume and especially because there's much more awareness around Vision Zero. Now, you know, people are calling for these things, but a study is taking more than a year to happen on average, right? And in the meantime, you know, once someone dies, all of a sudden, there's this movement to fix the issue. Okay. Why should we so, wait for deaths to occur when we know that, you know, a, a lot of times people are pointing out the intersections that are problematic? And, and I, you know, and, and this is what I've seen. I've been here 15 years consistently. If something bad happens, we will see a stop sign in two months when we've been calling for it for two years. So. Okay, I'm just saying that to put it on the record, I would hope we're going to be more proactive than reactive on a lot of this stuff. I applaud you for the work and pushing for the speed cameras, but that's one piece because speed cameras yeah. can't go on residential blocks, apparently. So I that's just want to mention we received in this administration a lot of additional funding for personnel for Vision Zero, okay? So we have absolutely increased our staffing both to examine and study as well as to implement. And we have more, we have done more of all of our safety um, items than we ever have in the past. So just to tick a few off, we have in 2017, this is all about 2017, we installed over 800 leading pedestrian intervals, which is a signal safety um, benefit, we put in 92 miles of priority corridor safety projects, um, 114 of our total safety projects, 25 miles of protected bike lanes, 400 speed humps, which is more than we have ever done before. So, you know, you're concerned about staffing. I want to just highlight that um, our numbers aren't reflective of a lack of staffing or reduced staffing. And then about your question about, you know, what's happening in your district and does someone need to get hurt for something to happen, what I want to suggest is that we come in and sit down with you okay. and look at your, your district and look at the Vision Zero corridors within that district and the nature of them so you know what, exactly what's on our radar and what we're looking to do projects in. And, and I'll say this, we have no, um, what's the name of the program, the Vision Zero program? We have no Vision Zero corridors, corridors. in our okay. district at all. Okay. And I find it astounding that Merrick Boulevard had over 100 accidents and we still are not right. automatically put into there that can batch. Be a lot, there can be a lot more in other 
quarters, but I want to go through the numbers. We need to right. show you that. But I will say this. I hear what you're saying. The stats are great. And I take hats off for the commitment by the mayor to, to address this issue. But it's not reflective in if you're saying staffing was increased in these areas, the studies are still taking way too long to get back to it. So if you're saying you added more staffing, something is wrong if it's still taking over a year to a hear A lot of DOT. people are coming to us, and that's yeah. and it's a good thing. But yeah. everybody knows about all of these different treatments, and everybody wants them. The numbers are going through the roof. Okay, so that that's probably Agreed, the reason. But in some cases, it, but I've been here 15 years, and it's, I'm not. My responses are no different than what it, when I was a staff member compared to being a council member. Now, so I'm just putting that out there. Mm -hmm. Not saying nothing is being done. But it's very clear that we need to ramp up more there. Thank you, Chair. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, uh, for this important hearing. I thank the administration for being here. And um, Chief and uh, NYPD DOT, I applaud your efforts and your commitment uh, to retaining the speed cameras around school. And I understand that this, this what this hearing is about. But based on um, the speaker's commitment, mayor's commitment, I, I, I trust that all that all bases are being touched and all that we can do at a city level is being done. So um, what I would like to focus my short time on is the other things that we have done that Council Member Rich has just talked about um, around schools and other places to, to mitigate uh, traffic hazards for our young people and others in our community so that we all, all that inhabit and all the pedestrians feel safe in, in walking. Um, there, is, there is one of the things that I've tried to do over the past five years to ensure that all parks, major parks and schools in the district uh, had safety provisions, either speed bumps, necessary stop signs, uh, daylighting, or whatever is necessary. Um, had this conversation with the commissioner, had this conversation with the Queens commissioner, and even with the best of intention, as my colleague said, um, we probably have 10% over the past five years. Uh, accidents continue to occur. Um, and as we have these kind of engagements about what we can do, and, and we know that speed bumps, everybody wants a speed bump until you get a speed bump and you want it going if it's in front of your home. Or, uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that they are very, very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, even in the areas of schools, uh, and in terms of coordination, we've had uh, we've been fortunate to have a lot of uh, street repaving in, in Southeast Queens, which means that for the motorists, it allows them to go off the main streets with the uh, traffic apparatus, and then they ride the side streets, which uh, basically uh, become freeways, and um, you can go nearly 10 blocks without stopping. And sometimes they're in front of schools and those should be priorities. And we've asked that when you have these situations uh, that we make sure that with the, uh, the repavings and the repairs that is accompanied by traffic apparatuses and, and usually that's only stop signs. That has become increasingly difficult to facilitate as well. Going back to what the councilman said, at what point does uh, is there an agency coordination or at what point does it kick in, trigger that something has to be done? I got trolled last summer by a woman who said it was a school bus accident at a particular street in Queens Village, 223rd Street, 107th Avenue. And as it turned out, there were 17 accidents in that location in three years. And uh, after we got involved, uh, two months later, it was a stops is a four-way stop sign there but there needs to be a better mechanism to figure that out that after two or three that there's a problem that we are um communities are asking for certain safety provision stop signs or whatever and it always has to be a study but i really want to focus on 
the areas around the school, what can we do to mitigate that in lieu of uh, the speed cameras? Can we stop signs for vision? I know we have one principal who wants the, the kind of illuminated stop sign on the corner, um, but there are not a lot being done. And every, I think every school has a problem with parents, double parking, um, not with the, the PTAs offered to come get the kids uh, two blocks up and they want to take their kid there. They're parking in folks' driveways, they're double parking. It's a real problem, but um, when the school's down and we have the summer to kind of figure this out, uh, we're going to go back to the same situation September that we left in June when school closed. Uh, are we focusing on how do we mitigate and how do we address the loss of the speed cameras? Okay. So DOT is constantly using all of the tools that we have. We're, we're going at it nonstop and we're going to keep doing that. So we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Um, last year we installed by, you know, for example, 60% more signals than we ever have. You know, we did the previous year and it's, it's going up and up. We also installed 757 all-way stops, um, which is more than we have ever done. So first of all, if you have locations you're concerned about that you're not getting information on, if you can let us know, we will make sure you do get that information. But I want to try to reassure you that we already have a very data-driven approach. So if we see accidents um, on the rise at a location that comes to our attention and we do look at it, okay? So we, and we have all of these things that we've talked about today in order to, to deploy there. So we wouldn't put a stop sign unless a stop sign was needed, but if, if one's needed, it would be there in a very, very quick time frame. And the same goes for a traffic signal. So we, we work very closely with our borough commissioner yeah. and um, <laughs> okay. that, that's just not the case. And, 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 we, and we get it out. We, we have trained the community mm -hmm. uh, that when there are accidents that they fill out proper reports. And that's been a problem as well that we've known that there's been five or six or seven accidents and we called a precinct and there were two accident reports filed, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. But specifically, I want to focus on how do we mitigate traffic incidents around the school area? Uh, some schools don't have speed bumps or traffic um, stop signs within uh, two blocks mm -hmm. leading up to the school. And that's what I'm saying. Like, even if they're right in front of the school building, but leading up to it, like uh, traffic, uh, the, the speed cameras covers what, a quarter of a mile? A quarter within. of a mile on the street before and after the school. Right, so we, we want to get close in, in, in the signage and whatever mechanisms that you have. So even if you have a stop sign two or three blocks ahead so that they don't have that full head of steam or that they have a, a speed bump around there, making sure that we have apparatuses to support the loss of the speed cameras or in lieu of the speed cameras even while okay, they're- And not. one other thing we want to mention is that a speed camera and a stop sign perform two totally different functions. So a speed camera gets at the speed of a vehicle in between intersections, okay? Whereas a stop sign obviously or a traffic signal is controlling the corner and it's controlling who gets to go at the corner. So it's very, very different. So a speed, a, you know, the things you're mentioning don't but they're not suffice mutually exclusive. for taking. They're, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. If you have to stop on this corner, that will and help. And then the next corner, then you're you're not. If you you're not doing 30 miles an hour from block to block, and you just pick it up in speed. So they're not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. would help to mitigate speeding if you had to look. If you can go 10, and when I say 10 blocks, I literally mean 10 blocks in residential communities without stopping mm -hmm. on perfectly paved roads is dangerous. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so we need to take a look at that. But when those blocks include schools, we have to be able to expedite uh, that happening. And, and that's where I'm, I'm, I'm getting at. I think we're all on the same page, but there is, those are the simple solutions. And I, and I, I know the study for, 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 for the, the, the uh, cameras and, and the, um, the lights and so forth. I think stop signs are relatively simple, but at the very least, schools, parks should have them. 
Where they're needed, yes, we agree, and we would, we would get them up. We, we have to comply with engineering standards. We won't just put them at every location. But I give you my word, if you have locations that you feel we're not responding to quickly enough, if you get them to me, we will make sure we do. I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you my three years. Yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm not one that, I, if we do a hearing, I'm not going to talk about some new stuff unless we finish last year. I'm going to send you um, what we have requested over the okay. past three years and see what has been checked off. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Council member, I have a, a running like conversation with Candace in your office. She can send it to me, if that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I would like to summarize. First, that it is in the interest of the whole city of New York, and in this case, the council and the administration to see the state senate going back to Albany and authorize the city to, main, to rest, restore the speed camera. Is that something that we can say that we agree? Yes. Yes. Okay. Completely. And, and we are also know that there's some, that's the idea, that's what we're fighting for, that's what we will continue mobilizing everyone together with TA, trans, Family for Safety Street, everyone who cares for the safety of our students in New York is we want the Senate to go back and authorize the city to maintain, to restore the speed camera. We also, as you heard, we want to not to be limited. And of course, we don't want to compromise that if we don't get the Senate to go and act, then we should do something else. Our interest is to get the authorization that we need as a city. But if by any chance they don't go back or they try to continue pushing back, from our end, from my end, I can say from the chairman of this committee, I hope that the administration will continue also advocating, you know, for all the way on how we can get the authorization to happen. And as I said, that can be, you heard that the governor should use his power to convene the state senate back there. I also feel that we should also encourage the governor to use his power for the executive order, knowing that, as you heard, probably you are not too sure from the city hall perspective. This is something that we, you feel that uh, the governor can do it. Based on what I heard from some people who are the experts in the law area, they feel that that's also doable. But the summary that we, are, we all want to maintain our speed camera. And you heard from my colleague also, and other uh, suggestions, you know, the, the crossing guard, you know, that's something that we hope that by any chance we don't have the speed camera by September 5th, that also we have alternative plan on reducing vehicles, continue increasing the ticketing to those drivers who are sp uh, driving over the speed limit. So I, with that, I would like to thank the administration. We've been partners with the Vision Zero in this initiative, and I know that we have a common interest, which is to maintain safety for our all, the whole 8.5 million residents, but especially in this particular case, to those students and the parents who walk every day around to the school. With that, I'd like to thank you, and now I'm gonna be calling the name for the last panels. For the next panel, Mark O'Connor from Transportation Alternatives. Adriana Espinoza from the New York League of Conservation Voters, Steve Vaccaro from Vaccaro and White, Edith Prentice from Disabled in Action. For the last panel, which will be uh, coming up after this panel, if you're here, it will be Oleg Chernovsky, Executive Director. Oh, no, this person's left. Um, Greg Mihalovich, American Heart Association. Is he here? Yes, he is here. You can join us. Uh, Steve Vaccaro from Battery Place, 17 Battery Place, another Steve Vaccaro. Okay, same person. There was another ticket. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. You will have three minutes.
Good afternoon. Um, my name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the director of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City and we're committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to there thank Chair Rodriguez for the opportunity to testify here in support of intro 322 of 2018. One of NYLCV's top priorities is ensuring that New Yorkers have access to sustainable, low-carbon modes of transportation. We believe that pedestrian safety and smart street design are crucial to achieving this goal. And with the safe and well-designed streets, New Yorkers can more easily pursue sustainable modes of transportation and reduce dependency on high emissions vehicles. That is why we strongly support Intro uh, 322 to deploy more Vision Zero street design standards on arterial streets. This proposal will advance New York City street safety initiatives. Um, the mayor's Vision Zero plan to end traffic casualties calls for the adoption of new street designs and configurations to improve safety. And with 2017 data uh, showing that 58% of fatal pedestrian crashes occurred on arterial roads, it's clear that the city must address arterial street safety to achieve Vision Zero. This, the legislation would also encourage the proliferation of green infrastructure, um, such as street trees and bioswales, which would help to uh, enhance the city's air and water quality. While Intro 322 provides a comprehensive list of standards that must be considered when redesigning major streets, it does not mandate that New York City DOT implement any specific elements, leaving the city's experts to make the best decisions on a project-by-project -project basis. We believe a thorough and transparent review of Vision Zero design standards will help these measures become the norm um, in redesign projects and keep the city's agencies accountable to the public. I'd like to thank the Committee on Transportation for your ongoing support for transit issues that concern our members, and I look forward to continuing this work in the future. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Greg Mihailovich. I'm the New York City Director of Grassroots Advocacy with the American Heart Association. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez and the members of the Council Committee on Transportation for the opportunity to appear before you in favor of Intro 322. So the American Heart Association is the nation's old, oldest and largest voluntary health organization dedicated to fighting heart disease and stroke, 80% uh, of diagnoses of which are preventable. Uh, that's why the AHA prioritizes increasing in physical activity because engaging in daily physical activity reduces the risk of obesity, coronary heart disease, stroke, hypertension, diabetes, and even some types of cancer. Promoting active transportation, which is the opportunity to bike, walk, roll, to work, school, or just around your community, is actually the leading evidence-based strategy to increase physical activity across the lifespan. So having this checklist of street design elements that enhance the safety of, of for all road users would not only reduce injury and death from traffic violence, but would also improve uh, health equity for all New Yorkers. So the vulnerable populations, which include uh, people of lower income, people of color, the elderly, people with disabilities, are often disproportionately affected by incomplete and unsafe streets. Pedestrian fatality rates are higher in these communities, and these communities also suffer from higher rates of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. So the American Heart Association recommends at least 30 minutes of moderate intensi uh, intensity aerobic activity at least five days a week to maintain overall cardiovascular health, and uh, an average of 40 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity activity four days a week to help lower blood blood pressure and cholesterol. So providing safe and active transportation options for these underserved communities will actually provide them an opportunity for daily physical activity and result in better health outcomes for all New Yorkers. Um, obviously talking to the Transportation Committee, you're well aware of uh, transit deserts and the first mile, last mile problem that many communities face. Um, having New York Street uh, adhere to a safe street design standard would allow many of these New Yorkers to safely opt for a brisk walk or a bike ride to traverse that last mile, first mile to home, work, school, wherever, and help them get that recommended amount of physical activity each week. So not only would New Yorkers be safer with the safe street design standard, but we'd be healthier as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mark O'Connor. I'm the legislative and legal director with Transportation Alternatives. Um, thank you, Chairman, uh, Councilmember Lander, uh, as well as uh, Councilmember Samuel, Joan I, and um, for the legislation that you have introduced uh, that can save lives. Um, we would like to also express our gratitude to the city for the work that has been done, to the council 
uh, which has resulted in historic reductions in traffic fatalities, um, even as traffic fatalities have increased nationwide. Still, however, the loss of life on our streets is unacceptable. Since 2001, more than 5,000 New Yorkers have died in traffic crashes, and every day, more than 200 people are injured. Uh, traffic violence is a public health crisis, and Transportation Alternative strongly supports the legislation of today's hearing as a critical means to reduce dangerous driving, prevent the loss of life, and achieve Vision Zero by 2024. Transportation Alternative strongly supports Intro 322, which cr would create a checklist of proven street safety and accessibility measures that the DOT must consider when re-engineering or repaving any arterial street in New York City. And critically, the DOT must publish online any reason for not including a particular design element. This creates transparency. Our city has done tremendous work in recent years, but it remains clear that much more must be done. And we must prioritize saving lives, inclusivity, and diverse mobility over the movement of cars and over parking. The majority of the crashes that killed 222 people last year occurred on arterial streets and were caused predominantly by behaviors like speeding and failing to yield. These behaviors are too often enabled by street design that prioritizes driver speed and convenience, while the safety and experiences of pedestrians and cyclists too often is relegated to an afterthought. A standardized street design is needed so that safety can be ensured by default. Once built, these streets are not subject to the shifting winds of politics. And Mayor de Blasio, I believe, should have an interest in preserving his own legacy when it comes to Vision Zero. The complete streets checklist would be an important step towards creating transparency and for the public to know when, for example, a proven safety element is sacrificed in order to preserve one or more parking spots, which happens repeatedly throughout the city. Furthermore, in order to be truly equitable and effective, street design and safety measures must, must be consistent across neighborhoods so that no part of the city is left behind. By employing the safety elements of this checklist, our city can cement a lasting legacy of safety into our streets. That legacy will encourage more people to walk and ride bikes, make bus service more efficient, and enhance the mobility of the elderly and disabled. I quickly also just want to state our strong support for intro 971, 972, and 1066 to impound the vehicle of repeat dangerous drivers. Uh, a dangerous driving study, and speed boards. Finally, we strongly support Intro 268 by Council Member Samuel, which will call upon the state legislator to pass speed cam legislation and for escalating fines for repeated violations and physician uh, reporting. A resolution from this council will help solidify the strong support, the support from throughout the city that shows a united city on this issue of speed safety cameras. And um, it will send a message that renewing and expanding the speed camera program is in the interest of all New Yorkers. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Steve Vaccaro. I am from the law office of Vaccaro and White, which has represented hundreds of crash victims here in New York City, including the families of Sammy Cohen Eckstein, Ali Liao, uh, who you've heard from already today, as well as Bernadette Karna. Um, I'm also a founder with fellow Safe Streets activists of Streets PAC, the organization that supports elected officials who are working to keep our streets safe and make them safer. Thank you, Chairman Rodriguez and Council Member Lander for your presence here. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate my comments. I passed out uh, my, my comments as written uh, with some attachments and I just want to draw your atta uh, attention to them because they address some of the previous testimony that you've heard today and I'll go through them quickly. Um, my, my major point is that we need to move from a, a um, criminal justice and law enforcement paradigm um, that we've been using for the most part and we rely exclusively on for street safety over to a public health paradigm. And that's what intro 971 and 972 would do. Okay, Instead of becoming ensnared in all of the issues that arise with treating um, 
misconduct in traffic as a crime or as a traffic violation, we should be able to look at the data and see that this is a behavioral problem and, and take the tools that we know that we have that can improve it and use educational rather than educational means rather than penalties to resolve them. So this legislation would identify what cars are being used in a dangerous way. We have these camera systems, the LMSI, the speed cameras, the red light cameras. We have NYPD officers who go to the scene of a crash when someone to fill out reports showing that a crash occurred and who was involved. And we can take this data and we can identify the, the, the vehicles that are involved. If you are working through a criminal justice paradigm, you have to have a perpetrator, and that's the problem. That's the reason why speed cameras don't involve points on the license, because there's this issue of, oh, who was driving the car? We don't know, may have been the owner, may not have been, so we can't apply a penalty to anyone's license. It's the same veil of anonymity that protects the owner of the vehicle, most likely the driver of the vehicle that struck Bernadette. Okay, because the NYPD doesn't know who was driving, they just drop the investigation, because if you don't know who the perpetrator is, what's the point of investigating anything more? Even if there's video that shows the collision, shows the license plate. I've attached the FOIL documents in Bernadette's case to my testimony. They show the vehicle, the license plate, and the back and forth between the NYPD legal bureau and the detective investigating her case. And they leave no doubt that it is the official policy of NYPD to drop investigations when they can't positively identify the driver of the vehicle, even when the vehicle is positively identified by license plate. The other attachment is a memorandum that was prepared by our law firm that explains why the city has the authority and the jurisdiction to enact this program, which is a program for education, intervention, and remediation, not criminal penalties. And once you get away from criminal penalties, you can do a lot more. And I believe we've, we've shown at the Red Hook Community Justice Center, we've shown with booting vehicles, it will be more of a deterrent with these hardcore, reckless drivers than the $50 penalties, which remarkably thousands, tens of thousands of drivers are willing to pay over and over and over again as the, as, as the cost of driving fast and putting the rest of us in danger. So this, this program is a different approach. I think it'll be a more effective approach and it'll address the concerns of critics who say, this is just a revenue grab when you have these speed cameras. Don't make it about revenue, make it about changing behavior. It will also address concerns that there will be disproportionate imposition of law enforcement on people of color. The, you know, through, through you know, the, the, the profiling that takes place with in-person policing. You know, you can address all of these concerns. This isn't punishment, this is remediation, this is education, this is not law enforcement, and that's the way you should be taking your continued Vision Zero efforts. My name is Edith Prentice, and I am here as a member of the Taxis for All campaign, which is a general tra transit issue discussion as it impacts the disabled. I'd like to point out my relative height. In many way, in ways, we are just like school kids. We're short, as well are many seniors. It's very important that one of the issues of concern is crosswalks and great big cars parked at crosswalks, which obstruct the vision of the driver of us as we cross the street. Similar to babies being pushed in carriages, where you literally have to peek out around the car to see if it's safe to proceed. We have many, many traffic issues that we need DOT to focus on. These 10 issues are very important, but there are issues, for example, the, you know, um, Vinny Gentili, when he was a council member, pushed a bill that allowed parking in crosswalks on T intersections. Well, that means you can't get onto the sidewalk where you're gonna walk to be healthy. You can't get off bus stops when the bus stops are on those side, same sidewalks. 
uh, when we had a this the speed the speed camera session in Brooklyn last week for Moped, I got off a bus and I couldn't cross this incredible street until the police officer jaywalked me. Um, we all know that cross streets require traffic signals, but there are lots of places people cross because there aren't other options that need to be looked at. We need to look at the safety, the everyday safety, and these items are very important. I just am concerned that they will become a situation where DOT has no overview from the world of New York City, from the citizens of New York City as to what our issues and needs are. There needs to be a dialogue, not a monologue. Thank you. So with that, we came to the end, right? Uh, the most important thing is to continue working to restore the speed camera. I'd like to thank everyone, yeah. Speaker Johnson, for his support, Councilman Melander, who also was very instrumental to get this emergency hearing. And I feel that, you know, it, with the pressure that we will continue uh, building in these next couple of days, hopefully we can be able to restore the speed camera. It, before I pass it to Council Member Land, if he has also a few words, I would like also to invite all New Yorkers to be part of our second train station tour, which we're going to be doing in September and getting in contact with other riders and see how much progress we've been making in our city. It, we did, last year we did our first train station tour and this time around we're hoping to do our second one in the month of September. So later on we're going to be sharing more information. So with that, Council Member Uh Mr. Chair, I look forward to riding the rails with you again in September as, as we did last year. That brought a lot of attention to the subway crisis and Sadly, we have not made enough progress. So um, uh, thank you guys all for being here and all for your advocacy and sticking through this whole uh, conversation. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to ask Steve a question or two following up on uh, Ms. Karna's testimony and also our speaker's uh, reaction to it. And I know that you um, drilled down a little more in your testimony. So I wonder if you could just say, for starters, a little more about this hit and run situation more broadly. Um, and the back and forth that took place between the speaker and Chief Chan about what we are and aren't doing in hit and run investigations. Okay, I'll say in the first instance that Chief Chan alluded to the collision investigation squad. That's the specialized NYPD unit that investigates the most serious collisions. Usually the fatal collisions are ones in which there is, is a likelihood of a fatality. Those cases get a serious investigation from the NYPD. No question about it. They are a tiny handful of the serious crashes that occur, the thousands of crashes each year that, that, that injure people. And we're glad that the police do that job in those cases. But in a case like Ms. Karna's, which brought her close to death, but thankfully left her alive and able to recover, there is not a meaningful investigation. And that's fully documented in the FOIL file uh, pages of which are appended to my testimony as distributed, and in the eight cases that are referenced in the um, letter to Chief of the Department, Terrence Monahan, uh, that letter of August 10th, which our firm wrote at the request of Chief O'Neill in a meeting that we had about street safety issues and these hit and run collisions. The problem is that the precinct level detectives who are not part of the collision investigation squad do not, generally speaking, investigate these cases because unless someone can identify the perpetrator, there is no hit and run charge that can be pursued and brought to a conclusion in a prosecution. So the 
ID of the car, the license plate, is just put in the file, it's buried, it is not shared with any other agency, and nothing is done with it. And this is, is really a, a waste of valuable information. And, and on dozens of clients that our firm has represented over the years, we have found precinct-level detectives unwilling to investigate these cases. And we put just a few as examples in our, in our letter as the attachment to Chief Monaghan. This should be one of the streams of data that is going in through 972 to inform the intervention and remediation program under 971. So police accident reports, so-called, every time there's a collision, there were two priors for the vehicle that struck Burnett, Bernadette Karna. Um, you know, the police collect that data. So the idea we have to get it from Albany, that's a dodge that you heard from some of the executive branch officials here today. If the police are collecting in the first instance, they can share it with their colleagues in city government and not tell you to go to Albany to get it. Same thing with the ID of the license plates of the hit and runs. They have it. Same thing with the LMSI. How many of those millions of license plate images captured each year are going to be vehicles registered to a driver with a suspended license? I think more than a few. And I think that someone should be looking to see, hey, this vehicle's coming into New York every day, in and out, and it's registered to someone with a suspended license, and then they're involved in a crash, and then there's tickets that they get on a speed camera or red light camera. Someone should put this data together. Uh, that's very helpful. And just I was struck by this in your testimony that there were, and I know this is something that the chair has really worked on, on hit and runs. There were 46,000 hit and runs in 2017. That's in the letter that you, you know, and that that, that, that... that includes property damage only cases. Yes, but still, you know, that's, I mean, if we, you know, and, and right now, if, if, if it triggers a CIS investigation, that might lead to identification of the driver and specific punishment. But if not, then, then even if we have the license plate, essentially nothing happens. It, go, it doesn't go into a database, it just, just sits in a file. That's exactly right. It's never used for so, anything except potentially civil litigation of the sort I do. So uh, on, in Dorothy Bruns's case, they ha she had been in a, a hit and run previously, they, they disciplined the officer who had put it in a file, but it sounds to me like that's actually the policy, is just like that nothing more would have happened to her on, in any case. That's exactly right. That's exactly the policy as articulated in follow-up number 10 from the investigation that was conducted in Bernadette Karna's case. It's attached to my testimony, and there a legal NYPD legal bureau attorney named Elizabeth Moley uh, gave the advice that there was nothing to pursue in this investigation because if the driver denied involvement in the collision, even if he said he was the only one with access to his vehicle at the time of the collision, well, there's nothing that can be done, even though that vehicle was identified by license plate. It, no, no one, if you ask them on the street, would say, if you do a hit and run and someone gets your license plate, there's no consequences. But that's what the rule is. In black and white, NYPD Legal Bureau. Hmm. Um, and then I asked this question of, of Bernadette, you know, where you found through FOIL that there were two prior crashes that that driver had been involved in. Do you know where the data came from to identify those two prior crashes? Yes, when there's a motor vehicle crash, usually someone calls the police, calls 911, the police come, there's a police accident report, it's called, filled out to document what happened, and that's where that data came from. And does that data go in either for the driver or the license plate into a database that the NYPD is keeping? This gets more to the what data we have to identify the most reckless drivers. The, the police send those accident reports to Albany, um, but they could just as easily share them with uh, the rest of city government, and um, that's what they should be doing. It's an important and valuable resource. There's something going on with someone who's been involved in three crashes in a year, probably. It's at least worth looking at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, Kasim, if, if I can just add, there's also a, a serious question as to, to whether the NYPD is even in compliance with state law when it comes to serious crash investigations. So under the state penal law, the, um, the NYPD is required to investigate any serious crash to determine whether a violation of state law or local law has occurred. And we know that uh, upwards of 3,000 serious injury crashes occur in New York City annually. But the, the CIS, the Collision Investigation Squad, investigates only three to 400 crashes. That includes probably every fatal uh, crash as well as a, a smaller portion of the serious injuries. Um, but uh, we know also that the NYPD actually has as a policy to not pursue, for example, right-of-way criminal um, violation investigations without the CIS investigating a crash. So essentially, you have the NYPD precluding by not sending out the CIS in those crashes, serious injury crashes, that they preclude that they're not going to even investigate uh, as to whether a certain you know, violation has occurred on the, the, the right-of-way law. Uh, the criminal portion. And so we believe there's a serious question as to whether the NYPD is even in compliance with the state uh, penal law. Uh, all right, thank you guys very much, Mr. Chair. I think, you know, obviously the, the, the near-term focus is getting the cameras back on there. Then the legislation we're looking at today starts to get at some additional treatments like for intersections and redesigns and for reckless driving. Let's get those things done. And then I think, you know, we did a hearing, it's now two terms ago, where we focused on CIS at a time when we really had, a, and we did get more resources to spec in the Bloomberg administration because they weren't even getting at that point, I think, to every fatal crash or, you know, but it sounds like we may have some work to do to look back again at CIS and what resources it needs to do its job. And then in the cases of these, um, crashes that CIS is not coming out to a real gap that we that we may want to come back and. Could I ask yeah. a question? Uh, what is the distribution of the ca schools that do have cameras? Are they equitably distributed across the city? Are they distributed in relation to where there are incidences of uh, of accidents to begin with? I think it's really important to question that. And also, the fact of the matter is, if you've got a speed camera on your school and one block away, there's no protection at all for, your, for, for anyone. Well, with, with that question, it, I can say that the city, the council being been fighting very hard for the state to allow the city to control all the speed camera that we need here. So that's our goal, that's our end, that's what we've been fighting for. So far, you know, we've been working with the NYPD and the rest of the agency, DOT, who are the ones that based on the data have determined so in, which, in which surround the school. We have those cameras, but you yeah. know, council member, it, we have a colleague here that they are introducing resolution that also would like for the state to allow the city to have all the power we need to determine where we have those cameras. I, I, as you know, I would like to end by saying that I will continue working with my colleague here, Councilman Melander. In the last budget season, we did uh, ask for an increase for the investigation squad unit. Uh, right now, we have an average like a 50 uh, individuals that are assigned to that uh, unit. That's not enough. Uh, with the 46,000 hit and run, many of those damaged, but 3,000 of those and the we individual being sent in critical condition to a hospital and one person dying in average per week in our city. So this is a epidemic that we are dealing with and definitely we will continue advocating together to see how we can see an increase of funding for that unit. With that, this hearing is adjourned.